This interview is part of the Oral History Project, sponsored by the State Bar of New Mexico and its Senior Lawyers Division. I am Terrence Rebo, a member of the Senior Lawyers Division of the State Bar. Today is June 24, 2008, and I am interviewing Justice Joseph Baca, retired, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Good afternoon, Justice Baca. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Terry. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, uh, we in the Senior Lawyers Division and me personally uh, would like to thank you for your willingness to participate in our uh, oral history project. We've started this project uh, over the last year or so uh, in an attempt to get on videotape various different lawyers and judges of historical importance in our state and to our legal community. So I thank you very much for your willingness to participate. I'd like to start this interview, uh, if it's okay with you, uh, going back to your early life. Uh, tell us when you were born and where. Well, uh, Terry, I was born October 1st, 1936. And I was born in the parking lot of the Whataburger at Fifth and Lomas in downtown Albuquerque. <laughs> Actually, uh, at that time, it was, uh, it was our home. And uh, my mother's bedroom was in the drive-through of the, uh, what ultimately became the drive-through of Whataburger. And so I was born at home. Uh, later on, the Whataburger was torn down, and now the Metropolitan Court stands on the site where I was born. So I, I, I think <laughs> I consider it a monument to my birthplace now. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Uh, how long did you live in that house, Justice Baca? We lived there until I was about uh, eight years old. And then we moved across the street, across uh, what was New York Avenue then, is now Lomas. And we moved to 621 Fifth Street Northwest, or North Fifth Street in those days. And that's now the site of the uh, district attorney's uh, office. So I <laughs> have one, one, uh, one legal complex to the next. Uh -huh. And I lived there. Uh, we, we ultimately, we, we kept moving on Fifth Street. I don't know why that was. Uh, we then moved to 414 Fifth Street, uh, the site of the jail now. And uh, then uh, in 1954, my family uh, moved to 905 Fruit Avenue, a little, little couple of blocks out of the downtown area. But uh, yeah, we had three houses on Fifth Street and, and then over to Fruit Avenue. All right. So uh, your, your historic karma involved <laughs> the law through your upbringing? I, I think so. Uh, the uh, the uh, courthouse was there. It was a beautiful old courthouse before they, uh, quote, modernized it and put up a white facade. But it used to be uh, a very historic-looking uh, courthouse with uh, winding sidewalks on a, a lawn. And I learned to skate on those sidewalks at the courthouse. And so uh, I, I guess I was destined to become a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who were the members of your family? Well, my father was a mother vaca, and uh, originally he's from the uh, Borellis area. His father and, uh, was uh, a railroader, worked at the, the shops. The family my, on my father's side comes from Valencia County from uh, Belen, and my dad was actually born in Belen, and uh, then uh, she, his mother went home to be with her mother. Uh, Belen means Bethlehem. He always tells me that uh, he, he was born in Bethlehem but opened his eyes in Albuquerque. My mother is from uh, Socorro County. Her name was Ines Pino Baca. She's from San Antonio, New Mexico, 11 miles south of, uh, of Socorro, now famous for the great hamburgers down there. And uh, she uh, uh, went to school uh, in Albuquerque as a young girl, went to St. St. Vincent's Academy, which uh, was in the downtown area, no longer exists. And um, they uh, met and married, and uh, the rest is history, as they say. Now, if you want to know about my siblings, I'll, I'll tell yes. you those. Uh, my father had a first wife. His first wife also was from San Antonio, New Mexico. I, th I guess he liked the ladies from, from down Socorro County. And his first wife, uh, Nestor Apodaca, was her name, and she died when she was 23 years old, very young. And so my dad was uh, a bachelor for a period of time. My mother was, uh, she says, an old maid school teacher. I think she was 30 years old when she married my father. And um, 
So from that union, uh, there was a son born, Donaciano uh, uh, Baca, Don Baca. And uh, Don, uh, well, he went a different direction than I did. Uh, he, all of us went to St. Mary's School in the downtown area. And when he uh, finished at St. Mary's School, he went to the University of New Mexico for a year or so and decided he wanted to be a doctor, and there was no medical school in New Mexico. So uh, grandfather, his grandfather, my grandfather working for the railroad was able to get him a pass, sent him off to Omaha, Nebraska, and he went to Creighton University and uh, eventually graduated from the, doctor, the medical school there and never returned to New Mexico, married and raised his family, and he's now deceased. Then I have uh, two sisters, actually three. There was one sister, uh, Mercedes, uh, who died when she was two years old. Then uh, another sister, Minerva Helene, who now lives in Houston. And then another sister, Margie Baca, who uh, passed away just this year. And then I was the baby of, uh, of the second family of Amado Nines Baca. Uh, what did your dad do? Well, my father did a variety of things. Uh, he also worked for the railroad, er, at the shops. And uh, at one time, the shops, uh, the people who worked there went out on strike. And so he and his brother then started a grocery store and a filling station called Baca Brothers uh, Grocery Store. And it was right at the triangle of uh, Borellis Road and, and South 4th Street, uh, right where the Borellis Coffee House across the street from there. There's the Joe R. Baca Park, now they're named after my cousin, not me. <laughs> and it's a little triangle shape of land right there, and uh, he was running that. Uh, he ran that until uh, the Depression came along and uh, lost the business. And uh, then he opened a, um, a, a, a shoe, not a shoe store, but, but a, uh, a cobbler shop. And uh, right on... Um, I think it's 2nd Street, 2nd and Coal, and ran that for a short period of time. And then the Second World War came along, and uh, he went out to California and worked in the shipyards in California. He was too old to be drafted at that point and, and worked in the defense industry there. He came back and uh, then worked for uh, Southwest Distributing, not Distributing, Southwest Houseware, and worked as a, uh, as a warehouseman there until he retired from there. Was there anything about your childhood or early adolescent experiences that influenced your decision to enter the law? There was <laughs> a very significant thing uh, that, that, uh, that I, I still think is quite remarkable. Uh, nobody in my family, uh, my mother, uh, she graduated from high school, and in those days when you graduate from high school, you, you could get a teaching certificate, and she graduated from St. Vincent, she, she taught. So she then uh, went to college in the summers and, and uh, so forth and cobbled together a few hours of college but never graduated from college. My dad only went to the fourth grade. And uh, so far as I know, uh, no one in my family had ever been an attorney or associated with the law at all. Um, but when I was growing up, uh, this is before television, I used to listen to Senator Dennis Chavez on radio. And he had been making political speeches, and I, I, I suppose that's a testament to what a nerdy child I was, listening to political <laughs> speeches on radio. But Dennis Chavez was uh, someone who was revered in, in the Hispanic and the, in the New Mexico community at that time. And uh, I looked into his background and found out that uh, he was a, a lawyer, and I presume that's what you did to become a United States senator from New Mexico, is you became a lawyer. And it looked like a good job. It was indoor work. It was clean, and he got to wear nice suits. And I thought that was great. That's that's what I want to do. <laughs> and uh, so I decided that uh, I want to be United States Senator from New Mexico. And I guess along the way, I'll have to pick up a law degree. And so I had no idea, no idea what lawyers did for a living, how, how they worked, uh, uh, how they functioned, uh, what you needed to do. But uh, but I started looking into it, and that's when I was 12 years old. That, uh, You're 12 years old. 12 years old. Yeah. When you talked to your mother and father about what you wanted to do, what were their responses? Well, my mother uh, really wanted me to be a plumber. Uh, and I, if I'd listened to her today, I'd be a wealthy man, but I, uh, I, I didn't. <laughs> uh, I, she was a little bit worried about me because I was somewhat of an indifferent student 
if you will. I wasn't uh, the, the best student, and uh, the nuns always used to send notes home that he just doesn't try. <laughs> I wish to, <laughs> wish to get after him. And so uh, I think my mother was always worried about that I was going to end up digging ditches or, or something. <laughs> That's what she thought. But uh, in the back of my mind, uh, I uh, thought, no, I, uh, I, I'm going to go to law school. And, and I, th there was nothing in my early academic career that would predict that. What did your father think? Uh, I, I think uh, about the same. He humored me along. And uh, I, I think he loved the idea, liked the idea. And uh, he uh, personally knew Senator Chavez, although I never met him. But uh, like everybody in New Mexico in those days, everybody at one point in their life had met Senator Chavez. I'm sure he had shook hands with, like Bruce King has sh shaken hands with virtually everyone in New Mexico. So. You know, I've talked to several people who have gone to St. Mary's School. Um, there were, must have been public schools at the time also. Yes, uh, yes. And uh, so what was the thrust at that point for people to go to a private Catholic school? Well, I, I think uh, those kids, those of us that were living uh, in the downtown area, which is essentially that was Albuquerque at the time, the downtown area, the Heights hadn't been invented until after the Second World War when uh, FHA and, and uh, GI Bill came in and uh, Dale Venomous, Venomous started building homes away from the downtown area. So much of us that lived down there was a fairly insular community. Uh, you were Hispanic, you were Irish, you were Italian, you were Catholic. And uh, so uh, many of us uh, went to St. Mary's and, and our, our parents. It was affordable, uh, not like private education at this day. I think it was something like $3 a month to, to go to St. Mary's. So it, it uh, clearly subsidized by the church and the Sisters of Charity and, and uh, whoever rented it. Uh, and so uh, there, there were a lot of people that, uh, that went to St. Mary's. I assume that St. Mary's was considered a better education than what you got in the public schools. Well, uh, I think that was the uh, th that was the uh, line that was uh, that we were supposed to have believed. <laughs> uh, I found out <laughs> to my chagrin uh, when I started the University of New Mexico and started competing with the uh, kids from Albuquerque High, and that, that was the only high, other public high school. There was Manal, St. Vincent's, Hardwood Girls School, and St. Mary's. And uh, the nuns used to say, if you misbehave here at St. Mary's, uh, we're going to throw you out, and you're going to have to go to Albuquerque High. And not only will you get a bad education, but you lose your immortal soul in the bargain. So uh, pretty much <laughs> we, we, we behaved ourselves. <laughs> and uh, so I got to the University of New Mexico and uh, there with these uh, people from Albuquerque High School. And uh, they, they were far more sophisticated than we were from St. Mary's. Uh, they had had uh, teachers who had uh, doctorate degrees in science, which we did not have. Uh, they, they had uh, really interesting uh, people, uh, uh, just a, a broader, more worldly awareness, I think, than, than we did. So for those of us that came from St. Mary's, 500 people at the school, and then uh, the University of New Mexico was 5,000 at the time. It was uh, a bit of a transition. Uh, it, was, it was difficult to, to make that transition. Uh, some faltered, some made it, uh, but uh, it... Uh, it that, 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 was, that, that was the situation that, uh, that we faced at that time. You talked about your decision to become a lawyer and it would be like Dennis Chavez, Senator Chavez. Uh, through your adolescence and during your college years, uh, did that desire to become a lawyer uh, and or a politician get refined or honed, expanded, lost? I, I think it got honed. Uh, with Sputnik, which occurred uh, when I was in high school, uh, people were then being urged to study engineering. And uh, really, I had no basis for studying engineering because I had not taken uh, any of the science courses or the advanced math courses and that sort of thing. I always said that St. Mary's produced a lot of lawyers, but very few doctors. Uh, we had a, a class of 32 students in a biology class with four microscopes and three worms. So th there wasn't a, <laughs> it, it wasn't an advanced science uh, curriculum that, that we had. Uh, so uh, I thought about that for a while, but I, I knew that that just wasn't so. And uh, 
so I, I really uh, didn't know uh, what it was that you studied to become a lawyer. And uh, I knew that uh, if you're going to be a, 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 if you're going to go into medicine, you study chemistry and biology and physics and uh, these sorts of things. And um, so, I, about the time uh, when I was getting ready to go to college, I, I wrote to several law schools and asked them um, what it is that I should study. And uh, they unfailingly wrote back and said anything, <laughs> which was not helpful at all. And, and that, did, that really didn't, uh, I didn't really realize that, uh, I guess, until I actually finished law school, became a lawyer and then a judge, and uh, found out that you need to know a little bit about everything. You need to know some medicine. You need to know some accounting. You need to know some how to raise cows. I've tried uh, cases involving uh, uh, milking machines that went bad. You need to know... Uh, astrophysics, uh, you need to know a lot of things. And uh, uh, so the, the broader your education, the, uh, the more liberal uh, arts your education entailed, uh, the better off you were going to be. Of course, they all emphasized you needed to speak well and you needed to write well. And uh, you needed to take difficult material, be able to read it, synthesize it, understand it, and, and speak about it. So anything you took, so so along that line, I uh, I uh, I decided one thing I did love, and, and so it was great for me uh, was uh, history, and so I, I majored in history and minored in political science. Mm -hmm. um, I want to backstep just a little bit during the period of your adolescence and during the period when you were at uh, the University of New Mexico. Generally speaking, what was it like to be living in Albuquerque during that period of time? Yeah. Well, Albuquerque, uh, as I was growing up, the watershed is the Second World War. I was born in 1936. And so I was very young, but I, I do remember Pearl Harbor, and, and uh, I do remember the war. It had a profound effect on all of us. Uh, and, uh, and I had cousins of uh, varying ages that, that were drafted and uh, were Iwo Jima and various places and all, all these places I read about historically, we had family that was there. And uh, so uh, the war, I think, had a profound effect on many, many people my age. Uh, and uh, Albuquerque, before the war, was a very small community and uh, was just coming out of the Depression and was almost a barter community, if you will. I remember we used to um, put uh, shoes and clothing and uh, things such as this, and we'd go up to the Manzano Mountains and we'd trade them for beans and uh, goat's cheese and things like this. So it was really a barter community. The Second World War came along, and uh, those same people that we were trading with up in the mountains, uh, they got drafted and they were paying them $72 a month to be a buck private in the Army, and they are sending about half of that home. It's the first time in a long time that anybody really had cash. <laughs> so that, that, that really changed how Albuquerque was. Then there were the war years, and the bases opened here, and a lot of people started moving here from other parts of the country. And uh, we'd never met people from New Jersey or Chicago or, or this sort of thing. As I said, it was very insular. And so it was a real eye-opener. Uh, uh, the, the town started to become a city at that point. Uh, when I went to the university, uh, as I say, it was 5,000 students in 1954 when I started. Um, the, um, what is it now, 25,000 students, I guess, on, on the Albuquerque campus, something like that. So it's a profoundly different place. Uh, both physically and uh, the number of people that are that are there. Um, Albuquerque, uh, pretty much you knew everybody. Um, people knew who your family was and, and you knew who they were. Uh, it was somewhat more of a stratified place than it is now. Uh, there might have been uh, just a bit more division among the Hispanic families and the Anglo families, if you will. Um, 
because Hispanic families tended to gather together and live very close together and uh, in close proximity. And, and so uh, there was an outreach and, and that sort of thing, but, but still it was a very family-oriented small community on the verge of becoming a city and now uh, uh, a mid-metropolitan area, much different today than, than back then. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else uh, about the way Albuquerque was during those formative years for you that uh, you can think of that you'd like to share with us? Well, there were, um, uh, the most exciting thing was uh, to go to the uh, theater, Sunshine Theater, the chemo theater on, on Sundays, and it cost 10 cents to get in. <laughs> and uh, you went to Payless and bought your candy there because it was more expensive inside, <laughs> so you took it in with you. Uh, athletics uh, at St. Mary's was a big thing, uh, although it was a small school. It, there were no divisions uh, in, in athletic teams. And so the big rival was the big school, the Bulldogs from Albuquerque High School. And uh, St. Mary's never won a football game against the Bulldogs <laughs> except in 1948 and again in 1955. <laughs> and, and, but from, from uh, St. Mary's just celebrated 100 years, about 10 years ago of existence. It no longer has a high school. But all during that time, I think they built, beat Albuquerque High twice. <laughs> so, so it, it was, it, but, it, but it was a, a good fight. So uh, yeah, there were great loyalties to your schools and great excitement about, uh, uh, about uh, high school athletics in that time. We, not so much about the university. We didn't know much about the university uh, then. It, 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 was, it was far away. Physically, it was far away. Now, it doesn't seem today that it was, but it was up on a hill away from the downtown area and just kind of another world. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, where did you go to law school? I went to George Washington University in Washington, D.C., it's so interesting how so many people from Albuquerque got to George Washington. And Georgetown, and, and Georgetown. Catholic, and American, right. yeah. Uh, what, what was your route to get there? Well, uh, 1952, I think, was the first year that uh, the University of New Mexico had a law school. So uh, before that time, uh, you had to go to law school somewhere else, just like my brother had to go to medical school uh, in, in Omaha. And Washington, D.C. was a place to go because uh, Senator Chavez and other senators, Senator Montoya and Anderson, uh, were hiring people, uh, making it possible to get jobs. Uh, the, the, the Georgetown, George Washington Catholic and American were very blue-collar law schools. They had night programs, day programs. Uh, most folks who went there uh, worked in the government, worked on the Hill. Uh, were able to uh, go to night school, go to day school, or a combination thereof, and, and cobble together a degree and then, then come back. The University of New Mexico opened up, and um, under its first dean, uh, the, the, uh, Gosowitz, I think his name was, yeah, Gosowitz, uh, it was off to a good start, and there are a lot of uh, lawyers still practicing today. Uh, Dick Civarella is one, was graduated in the very first class which was 1952, I guess. Maybe it was 49, 50 that it opened, 52, 53 was the first class. Then uh, Vern Countryman became dean. I'm not quite sure when he was dean, but he was dean of the law school at the time that I was dean, or that I was graduating from, from, law, from college in 1960. You'll notice the 54 to 60, I was on the six-year plan to, to get my, my degree. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, this hasn't been a <laughs> trajectory from straight up. Was that more of the or academic excellence that your mother was talking yeah, that's, about? That's exactly right. Uh, and, and finally I settled down <laughs> and uh, really got with it. Uh, but in 1960, uh, this is interesting, when I graduated from the University of New Mexico, UNM Law School awarded 10 law degrees. And what happened to everybody else, the other, uh, I'm not sure how many they're admitting at that time, they admit 125 now a year, they admitted more than that before. So out of the uh, 200 or 150 folks that they admitted, they had flunked out or run off everybody else. And, and it, it was, it was, <laughs> so 
There, there is an era right in there, uh, in, in the uh, late 50s and 60s and beyond, uh, where there are a lot of folks that have graduated from uh, Denver, Creighton, and Wyoming law schools who went to UNM for a semester, figured they're never going to get out of this place alive, <laughs> and got out of there. Or uh, like a lot of my friends stayed for the year and didn't make it out and are selling insurance or doing something else in their, their law, to, law career. So uh, for me, it was two things. One is I just wasn't going to take a chance uh, with those kinds of odds of 10 people finishing. Uh, and, and the other thing is I'd lived in Albuquerque all of my life, and I was very interested in politics. And so Washington, D.C. was just absolutely the, uh, the place to go. I had many friends that were, were there in Washington. And so um, I applied to um, Georgetown, George Washington Catholic and American, and by return mail, uh, they all admitted me, and none of them would have me today. <laughs> but, uh, but in those days, they, they too had a system uh, that, that was now, it's very difficult to get into law school. You have to have the grades, you have to have the LSAT scores, uh, and they're selective. Even though we have a 200 accredited law schools, they're still very selective. Uh, but in those days, they let you in, but they didn't let you stay in. And, and the most egregious example of that was UNM with graduating 10 people. The Washington Law Schools, uh, they did that as well. They virtually let most people, not quite an open admission policy, but they let most folks in. And, uh, but not most folks finished. So there, there's that look to the left, look to the right, and only one of you will be here. What uh, made you decide to go to George Washington? Well, uh, Actually, uh, the only place I'd really heard of was Georgetown. Uh, Senator Chavez went to Georgetown, by the way, uh, and several other people. And uh, I'd never been to Washington. I'd never been east of Portales, New Mexico, when I, I uh, got on a plane and went to Washington, D.C. And I, I went back there and uh, started um, uh, visiting with folks that I knew and, and other people that I'd met. I went a couple of, well, a month early, I guess, before classes started. And I uh, went, uh, went around, and actually uh, there's summer classes, and I remember going to uh, some summer school classes at the various places and just talking to people. And I met several folks that were from New Mexico that were going to GW and several from New Mexico going to Georgetown and uh, American and Catholic. And uh, um, I, I, I cannot... The, I, I really don't know what the deciding factor was. There were some people that were at uh, GW who I knew from New Mexico, uh, thought a lot of, they were going to school there, seemed to, to be doing well and happy. And, um, and uh, that, that's, that's where I, <laughs> about unstudied as, as that is in the choice. But I was very focused on the fact I was going to go to Washington. <laughs> Um, how about the people who went to George Washington uh, Law School mm -hmm. during the period of time that you were there that were also from Albuquerque? Uh, uh, Ted Howden is, was one who was there and he came back to New Mexico. Um, there was another, uh, Jerry Verkler, who continued uh, working for Senator Anderson, continued working on the Hill, never came home. Uh, there, uh, uh, after me uh, were, were uh, Joe Caldwell, who became a judge in Taos. Benny Flores uh, became a judge and then on the Court of Appeals. Um, who else? Um, another one of my uh, classmates at George Washington was Harry Reid, now the United States Senator from uh, Nevada. Obviously, he did well. He, <laughs> he went home, became lieutenant governor, congressman, and, and now a majority leader of the Senate. So, uh, uh, most people who were there at that time uh, were like me. They they were uh, they they were interested in coming home and and uh, and getting into politics and public service. There was a whole lot of that, very competitive atmosphere, if you will. A lot of uh, guys who had been president of the student body and, and uh, were, you know, were moving in that direction, honing their skills, their political skills. And uh, so uh, now my, my daughter graduated from George Washington in, in uh, 205. And uh, 
they're all interested in going to Wall Street or the big New York law firms and <laughs> making the big money, and not, not so much uh, public service anymore. But but it costs a lot more. <laughs> it well, costs uh, uh, infinitely more now. One hundred and seventy-five thousand a year to start, plus incredible benefits, is yeah. a strong lure. Is a strong lure, and then when you pay been paying thirty-five thousand in tuition, have a hundred thousand dollars in uh, student loans, then. <laughs> Public service is not quite as attractive as it once was. When we're paying five hundred dollars a semester. When you went to law school, uh, did, did you work on the Hill, or do you work in I, government at I, all? I worked for a short time with uh, Senator Anderson. I worked for a month, and uh, then uh, I. Uh, it, the position you got depend on how politically active your family was. <laughs> The, the great jobs were being an elevator operator or being a Capitol policeman. Harry Reid was a Capitol policeman for a congressman from uh, uh, from Nevada. Uh, Carlos Lucero, who's on the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, worked for a congressman from Colorado when uh, when, when he was there. Uh, I didn't have the political juice, if you will, so I, I just passed through the senator's office, and then they found me a job with the FBI. And so uh, as, as, uh, I had to be cleared by the FBI to work for them. And so I uh, went to work for the FBI and worked for them for six months. You're obligated to work for six months uh, because it took so much money to, uh, to clear you. And so I, I worked for them. And it was uh, not a very good place to work. And I started in night school. And because uh, there was, you, you, Every, everything you did at the FBI was regulated. Every, everything you did was counted and, and accounted for at the end of the day. So there, there was no time to study or do anything like that. As there, If you were on the night force on the police department, you got to sit at a desk, <laughs> wave people in. And <laughs> so there were a lot of medical and, and dental, uh, and, uh, well, dental and, uh, and uh, law students that did that. So I worked for about six months at the FBI. Uh, then a funny thing happened on the way uh, the Berlin crisis occurred. Nobody remembers the Berlin crisis, but President Kennedy um, had gone to Vienna and met with uh, Khrushchev. And Khrushchev did some saber rattling about that time. And then uh, the Berlin Wall went up. And uh, when that happened, uh, much like the beginning of the Iraqi war, I was, I was in the National Guard at the time. In those days, you had seven years of military, eight years of military service that you were obligated for. You could do it in active military for four years and the reserve for four years, or serve in the reserves or the National Guard. I joined the National Guard here in Albuquerque, the Air Guard, transferred to the Washington, D.C. Guard, and my Washington, D.C. Guard unit got activated. And I had accumulated about 10 hours of, of law school credit, and I was zipped away. And so I was stationed at Andrews Air Force Base uh, outside of Washington in Maryland. Uh, I served then for a year uh, in the military, and then the, the crisis subsided, and we were starting to deactivate and send us home. And at that point, I'd lost another year after six years of uh, getting my first degree, and then one year of futile, futility of getting 10 hours. And I thought, I'm never going to graduate from law school. So I, I then decided to go to day school. And so essentially, I finished law school in two years. One summer, I picked up 14 hours going ba both day and night school. Mm -hmm. And so I just went straight through and, and finished the 80 hours, the 70 hours yeah. remaining. How did you find the studies in law school? Were they easy for you? Were they challenging? I uh, never got it. Um, I, in college, I, uh, I knew exactly what I needed to do and how hard I needed to work to get an A if I wanted to get an A. Uh, but the, uh, the, the method, the, uh, the, the Socratic method, the casebook method was infinitely different from, from what I was used to uh, as, as a history major, political science major. And uh, it, it uh, it was very intimidating. Um, you, there were big classes, especially in the first year of the contract torts and that sort of thing, and some really, really bright people in, in law school. 
And uh, they were all from New Jersey and New York, and they were f talking faster and louder and with more authority than I'd ever heard anybody speak in my life. And, uh, and the law professors were equally. <laughs> and uh, so I was like watching a tennis match. <laughs> it was very intimidating. And, uh, and I, I still marvel that I survived the whole process. But I did. <laughs> did okay. Uh, now, everybody complains about bar exams. But when I was studying for the bar exam, I think it's because I compressed three years of study into essentially two years that I ran through there without reflecting or thinking or trying to assimilate the whole process. But when I sat down to study for the bar exam, I thought, oh, well, this is how criminal law relates to torts and torts relates to procedure and procedure to evidence. And then, then a cohesive whole started to develop. And uh, so uh, when people complain about bar exams, they, there's a right to complain about them. Um, but I, I think they do serve that pooling together process, at least it did for me, and I think it does for a lot of people, that you get the big picture, the whole picture. And uh, so uh, that, that in a nutshell was, was, was my experience with law school. While you were in law school, were there any professors or role models or uh, people that helped inspire your career or point you in the direction you eventually took? I, I can't point to anyone specifically. Uh, there, there was one uh, professor that we had, and, and everyone had a professor like that, and uh, that was Monroe Friedman, who uh, taught uh, contracts, the, one of the first courses that you take. And it was, he was like the paper chase. I can't remember the, uh, the, the professor that was scared everyone to death when Monroe Friedman did that. <laughs> and I, I remember going back, I think it was my 10-year reunion, and um, we were uh, there, and, and they invited Monroe Friedman to come back. By that time, was teaching at Hofstra, I think. And there were a group of people there. The only people that go back to reunions are those that are quite successful. And so everybody there was, by definition, successful, either in the government or big law firms or making a lot of money doing whatever. And each one of us got up to, to talk a little bit about Monroe Friedman. And I said, I'm looking out here and seeing all of these successful people. And I said, is there anybody here who got an A from Monroe Friedman? <laughs> there was not. <laughs> anybody got a B? <laughs> no. And, and so uh, uh, I'm not sure that uh, uh, he had an influence, except that, uh, by golly, if you survived his class, you were, you were eventually <laughs> going to graduate from law school. So you graduated from law school. What happened next? Well, uh, then I uh, came back to New Mexico and uh, set for the bar exam. And uh, well, before that, actually, I, I uh, clerked for a short time at the uh, highway department in Santa Fe in the legal section. And uh, then I, I set for the bar exam. And then, like today, when people uh, are go to law school in their uh, second year, you try to go to work for a law firm with the idea that uh, you're going to prove yourselves to them and they're going to offer you a job, and then by the time your third year comes around, you're, you're, you're set for that, or, or you have a clerkship, or you delay the uh, start at the law firm to finish your clerkship. But in those days, uh, things weren't quite as formal. There were far fewer lawyers graduating at that time, far fewer lawyers practicing. And so it wasn't until after you actually um, passed the bar exam or were ready to, to, to go to work that you actually went out and looked for a job. And so I, I didn't know any lawyers, and um, so I, I just went around. I'd heard of a few lawyers, and I just went cold knocking on their door. I'd heard, heard of Arturo Ortega and Lorenzo Chavez and uh, uh, Biamonte, Phil Biamonte, and uh, a few folks like that, and uh, just knocked on their doors and kind of get the lay of the land and see if there, anybody was hiring. And uh, I, it was uh, Art Ortega uh, who said that he was not, but he thought that, um, that uh, Alfonso Sanchez in Santa Fe, the DA, was looking for somebody. 
And so he called Al up, and he says, yeah, send him on up and let's talk to him. And so I went up and spoke to Al, and he offered me a job. And I, I, that was my first job, assistant district attorney in Santa Fe, which, by the way, was something I never wanted to do. I always envisioned myself as a defense counsel, not, not a prosecutor. <laughs> And as it turned out, it was absolutely a superb job. It was, uh, it was a small office, and uh, there were some assistants uh, who uh, a couple were less than diligent, and so a lot of the new work fell on me. And so, you know, within a couple of weeks, I was trying first-degree murder cases, which was absolutely <laughs> a thrill uh, to finally stomp around the courtroom and... Uh, hand someone, a, <laughs> would you identify this document, or would you please uh, mark this document, and uh, just like on television or in the movies. And, and so it, it was a wonderful job, wonderful experience. What was your first trial? My first trial, you know, everybody talks about what great winners they are and how well they did. Well, I was really quite brilliant in this trial. It was a, uh, it, it was a, a, a cattle rustling case, which I thought was really great. New Mexico cattle rustling. It was up in Rio Riva County. And uh, it was my first week on the job, and it was Friday. Al Sanchez came in and threw this red file on my desk. And he said, we're going to go up to Tierra Maria, and we're going to have a session of court up there, and you're going to be responsible for trying this cattle rustling case. And I had, uh, clinics had not been invented when I went to law school. We had no clinical training at all. I, I, this is the first time I'd ever seen a pleading. And I looked at the complaint, and there was a certificate of mailing, and I thought, what a good idea, a certificate of mailing that everybody knows that you mailed this out. That's how naive I was about, about pleadings. And uh, so by Monday, I had to be ready to, to try this case. And, um, so it, and by the way, we didn't have uniform jury instructions, uh, nothing of that nature that we have now that make it much easier to to prepare for a case. So we went up to, uh, to TA, Tierra Maria, and I got to sit at, uh, through another trial. Uh, there was a, a, a great lawyer there, Chano Chavez, who was uh, another assistant district attorney. And he tried the first case, picked the jury, tried the case. And then I sat beside him and uh, was able to observe what he did. And then my case was called up, and it was the second case. And in those days, cases lasted a half a day to a day. And, and you were done. And so the next day, we uh, John Lord from Farmington came down, was representing the young man who was accused of stealing these two cows. And uh, I went through the picking of the jury and uh, went through all of that, made my opening statement, presented my evidence, and then John Lord got up, and uh, just Judge Scarborough was the judge. And he says, I want to move for a directed verdict, and I oppose that. And Judge Scarborough granted the directed verdict and threw me out of court. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and to make it even worse, all the family came rushing up and were hugging John Lord. He <laughs> 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 said, what about me? <laughs> so that's how I started my, <laughs> my trial career, but uh, it got better. <laughs> I'm glad to hear I, that. I found out uh, later on that the uh, the case had been hanging around for, for months, and nobody wanted to try it. They said, give it to the new guy. <laughs> let, let, let him. <laughs> it, it was an unwinnable case, <laughs> I found out. But, but you learn. Always do. Um, how long did you stay with the DA's office? I stayed for a year. I stayed for a year. Started out making 500 a month, and uh, it left. I was making 600 a month, which was a virtual king's ransom in those days. <laughs> that would have been, what, 1964, uh, 1965, yeah. somewhere yeah. around uh -huh. there? That's right. Uh, anything, any uh, unusual cases during that year's period of time that you tried? We, um, well, they, they were all unusual. <laughs> And, and I, I, I think what has changed uh, is the, the nature of, uh, of a district attorney's office and the nature of people who commit crimes, and particularly in the first judicial district, which was a small place at that time. There, were, there was some rhyme or reason to uh, the kind of violent crimes that we had. Uh, murders were usually uh, family members and, and uh, lovers, spurned lovers, and, 
and, and this kind of thing was understandable almost, uh, the, the kinds of things that happened. And uh, there was uh, very little drug-motivated crime as we see today. And, and th there's absolutely no rhyme or reason to uh, certain things that, that occur today. If someone was going in and was going to hold up um, a, a convenience store, uh, if they got the money, they would, they, they would walk away. But now people have their brains fried with whatever drug of choice is, and uh, the, the perspective of reality is lost on them, and, and you still get shot, even, even though you, you, you do everything they tell you to do. So it, it's, it's, it's much scarier today than, than the kinds of things that, that we used to prosecute in those days. So when you left the DA's office, where did you go? Then I came to Albuquerque, and I uh, went to work for a firm called Hartley Olson and Harris. Uh, Earl Hartley was a senior partner. Earl Hartley had uh, just finished a term as uh, attorney general, and uh, originally from the east side, from Clovis. And uh, uh, Tom Olson uh, had been one of his assistants, and was uh, th it was a new, a relatively new firm that, that had been started up. And uh, and Lou Harris and. Um, Tom Olson had worked uh, for many years for the Department of Interior. And um, so as a result of that, it was well known to the Indian tribes in New Mexico. And so before it was fashionable or even profitable, we represented most of the Indians in New Mexico. We represented the All Indian Pueblo Council, the Hickory Apaches, the Sandias, the Santa Claras, uh, uh, two or three other, uh, other Pueblos. And um, so uh, it, it was a very interesting kind of practice, and, and I, I kind of moved in there and was uh, junior counsel, uh, along, did a lot of work with Tom representing the Indian tribes, mm -hmm. which essentially was a, a business practice. Uh, their dealings with the federal government, their dealings with various contractors and so forth, and trying very hard to uh, do some economic development on the various reservations very different than uh, the position now with the casinos. Yeah. Um, how long did you stay with that firm? I stayed about six years with them, and uh, then uh, we, we, uh, Lou Harris left, and the, the firm, we continued to, to uh, work together because we owned property downtown uh, uh, on 6th Street. Uh, we, we owned a couple of three houses, actually. One of them was our office and a couple of rentals. And so we, we were kind of bound by that. So we stayed together, although at some point we were individual practitioners, no longer the, the law firm. And then uh, I, um, I uh, went to work for uh, Art Ortega and Bill Sneed. And uh, so I went to work for them. And I was with them for a very short period of time. I, I guess I should go back to an event that, that, that occurred before that. In 1969, uh, I ran as a delegate to the Constitutional Convention. We hadn't uh, revised our uh, Constitution since the original 1910 Constitution that was adopted in 1912 when we became a state. And so uh, the legislature had appropriated funds for calling of a Constitutional Convention. There had been an interim constitutional study commission that uh, prepared a, a study. And then the governor signed an order uh, calling for a constitutional convention, Judge uh, Governor Cargo. And so 70 people, that was the number of people in the House of uh, Representatives, that, so there were 70 seats in the House. So we ran from uh, legislative districts. And I ran from District 6, which was downtown, Old Town, and um, uh, that, that area around there. And uh, so I ran against an incumbent state senator, Tony Lucero. And the conventional wisdom was that Tony was going to win that because he was so politically uh, uh, connected. Um, I, and I, I knew nothing about politics, essentially, but I, I knew I wanted <laughs> to get into it. So I, uh, I um, paid the $50 to filing fee. Uh, you had to collect 50 signatures to get on the ballot, and it was a nonpartisan election. You didn't run as a Democrat or a Republican. And so I ran. And uh, 
about that time, I was engaged to be married, so I was running for office, planning a wedding, <laughs> and, and, and so my, my poor wife has been in, immersed in politics. I've run 13 times in my career, and uh, so she's been immersed all, all this time. Anyway, um, I spent uh, $48 on the campaign, and I won by 100 votes, 188, uh, 388 to 488, mm -hmm. and was a uh, Constitutional Convention delegate. And um, there was a young man who had been Speaker of the House of Representatives, and um, he was elected president of the Constitutional Convention. That was Bruce King. And uh, we, we, as delegates, had, a, had an opportunity to vote on who the president was going to be. And I voted for uh, Herb Hughes and not for Bruce King. <laughs> And I, I think uh, a tribute to Bruce King and his political acumen, uh, how he never held a grudge, included everybody. And when the Constitutional Convention convened in Santa Fe, we were a bunch of novices. There were very few people who had held any political office before, there were two or three legislators, but mostly everybody was their first time ever holding uh, a political office. And so we're milling around noisy, uh, undisciplined, and we had this election, and Bruce King was elected, and he slid into the chair and brought order out of chaos. It was almost biblical <laughs> the way he did it. And we all sat down, and uh, then the, um, the order of business was set, and, and we went through smooth 60-day uh, session writing a new constitution for New Mexico. So that's where I met Bruce. Wow, that's exciting. Yeah. So what was your participation? in that constitutional convention? I served on the uh, two committees. I served on the legislative committee. We drew a new legislative article uh, for, and we're wrestling with whether we'd have a bicameral legislature, a unicameral legislature, uh, how long the terms would be, um, all, all of these kinds of things, whether they would be compensated, whether you'd have a, a, a soft ending to a session, whether you would have a hard ending to the session, whether they meet every two years, all of the, all of the structure of, of the legislature. And uh, then I, I served on the, um, uh, uh, what was the title of the committee, having to do with the mineral rights in New Mexico, and uh, served on that committee and, and all of the legislative uh, admonitions about oil, gas, and and so forth, and water rights in, in New Mexico. Well, those are two crucial committees. Yes. So how did you manage to serve on both of those committees? Well, everybody served on two committees, and, and the governor made, their, the Bruce <laughs> made the, uh, the appointments. And, and as I say, uh, he, and this is another stroke of genius, he had three people running against him, uh, Mary Walters, um, uh, Dorothy Klein, uh, Herb Hughes, and Filo Cedillo, and he made them all vice presidents of the convention. <laughs> it was like Lincoln taking all, <laughs> all of his enemies and holding them close, making them part of his cabinet. So uh, he, he did that. And uh, so I, I was thoroughly impressed with uh, Bruce King and his abilities and his understanding of government and how he, how he ran that, and his fairness, absolute, total fairness to everybody. And uh, so uh, you, you put in, uh, you, you, you made a request where you wanted to serve. And uh, I can't remember if those were my two top requests, but certainly the Legislative Committee was, was one, and, and I got appointed. That's wonderful. I mean, that's, the, those are exactly the kinds of stories that we're looking to preserve uh, in doing these oral histories. Now, you mentioned before that you've had 13 political elections. That's right. Uh, I'm not sure you're going to remember all of them, but uh, <laughs> can you give us categories? Okay. Well, the, um, the well, the, the, filling out from the Constitutional Convention. After the convention was held, we had an election to whether or not to adopt the Constitution, and we had to go campaign for it. Those of us who had been delegates, and uh, Bruce King kind of headed that up, and I was very active in that effort, and, and uh, got fairly close to uh, Governor King at, at that time. And uh, so we campaigned, trying to get it uh, approved, and there was some opposition here and there. 
an election was held, and um, it was not approved by 2,000 votes statewide, so just by the, the skin of our teeth. However, most of the things that we proposed have been adopted by piecemeal adoption of the Constitution, like the uh, cabinet form of government that exists, didn't exist before, but it was something that, that we had proposed. Uh, I think what we had done that uh, that uh, doomed the uh, the, the uh, Constitution is we shortened the ballot. Uh, we made the Attorney General, the Land Commissioner, the Treasurer, and the Secretary of State appointive offices rather than elective offices. And people in New Mexico love to elect their, and, and so there there was a lot of uh, of uh, opposition in regard to that. But the process was to go out and campaign and, and try to get it approved and work very closely with Governor King. And um, so about that time, I, I, I can't quite, I, I, I don't know exactly when it was that I decided that maybe a career in the judiciary rather than being a United States Senator <laughs> would, would be what I wanted to do. And. Um, so uh, I started thinking about being a judge, being a trial judge. And right about that time, uh, Judge McPherson, Danny McPherson, retired. And so uh, I kind of threw my name in the, in the ring. Let governor, in those days, the governor simply appointed. There were no commissions. There were some informal commissions. The state, uh, in the county where the judge sat, or the counties, in this district, a commission, a voluntary commission met. And, uh, and they would recommend names to the governor. And the governor didn't, wasn't obligated to appoint anybody. He just used them as an advisory committee. Governor King used that uh, very well in fending off people who wanted to be judges and he couldn't appoint everybody, so he would narrow it down to the list that was sent to him. And uh, on the other hand, Governor Anaya, on the other hand, says, I don't want those lawyers telling me who to appoint. I'm going to ignore. <laughs> if you got on the list, it was probably bad for you. <laughs> but but uh, that's the way uh, Governor King handled it. So the, uh, the McPherson appointment came up, and uh, I threw my hat in there. And uh, Mary Walters, who had been a delegate to the Constitution Convention, uh, was also interested in that. Bruce King was very interested in appointing the first woman judge in New Mexico. And so he appointed Mary. And uh, Tony Anaya was working as administrative assistant to Governor King at the time. And so Tony called me up and he said, uh, I have some bad news as the governor is not going to appoint you. He says, but he didn't want you to read about it in the newspaper. He wanted to give you the courtesy of letting you know. And he says, he's going to appoint Mary Walters. And I said, well, if I can't get it, then, then <laughs> Mary's great. So I called Mary to congratulate her, and she hadn't heard yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said, well, Mary, <laughs> you're going to get a call. <laughs> and the governor, of course, appointed Mary Walters. So then I went back to work, and, and uh uh, still in the back of my mind was thinking about uh, uh, becoming a judge. And um, I was about a year later, I guess, uh, Judge Reedy, Bob Reedy. Uh, one morning I, I woke up and uh, heard on the radio that he had died. He had had some sort of emergency surgery and it was on St. Patrick's Day. And uh, uh, went into the hospital and he died. And um, so that created another vacancy. And so I uh, then let the governor know that I was interested again. And so this time, <laughs> he had already appointed uh, the uh, first woman. So he was appointed. It's hard to believe now. Uh, when I went to law school, I, I worked in a law library. And it's the first time I became interested or aware of Martindale and Hubble. And so I uh, went through Martindale and Hubble looking for any lawyer named Baca. And I went through all 50 states, and there was not a lawyer in the whole United States named Baca. Uh, in Albuquerque, there had only been one and a half judges who were Hispanic. 
Miguel Otero in 1912 was the first judge in the second judicial district. And then uh, Paul Larazzolo later on, uh, who was sitting at, at about that, about the time I was appointed, uh, was Hispanic. But everybody thought he was Italian. His <laughs> name was Larazzolo. <laughs> so there had been no Hispanic judges. And so uh, several people were interested in seeing an Hispanic judge appointed. And um, so Bruce King could then, then have another first and a half, I guess, <laughs> first woman, and uh, then maybe the uh, first clearly identifiable Hispanic judge in modern times, and he, and he appointed me. And what year yeah, was that? 72. Okay, we need to go off the records for us to change the tapes, so we'll go off the record now. Am I uh, too much? Too Beginning of tape two. All uh, right, Justice Baca, we're back on the record. <laughs> you were talking about when you uh, first got appointed to be a judge by uh, former Governor King. What were your thoughts as you took the bench? Well, uh, my thoughts were how to get reelected. <laughs> let me let me explain that. You didn't know whether you're going to like the job. Or not. Well, that's exactly right. I didn't know whether I was going to like the job or not, but but I thought I might because uh, uh, some of my happiest times were in the courtroom as an assistant district attorney trying cases. I I really like that rough and tumble uh, atmosphere of the courtroom. And in private practice, doing uh, essentially transitional work, uh, working with the Indians, which was very satisfying. Uh, we, we didn't do a lot of trial work. Uh, working with Art Ortega, I, didn't, I wasn't with him long enough. I only tried one jury trial with him, uh, although Art had a very, very active uh, jury trial practice, as, as we all know what a, what a, a legend he was as, as a trial lawyer. <clears throat> but the, the interesting thing was I was appointed I was sworn in on Monday, and on Tuesday I had to go to Santa Fe and sign up for the election. In those days, you didn't collect signatures. It was before the signatures were, were implemented. You had to file 10 percent, uh, a check for 10 percent of the salary, and then you were on the ballot in, in, and file a declaration that you were running for this particular office. And, and so uh, that's what I did. And not only me, but several other people did the same thing. <laughs> uh, in the Democratic Party, uh, uh, I, I signed up, Joe Zook signed up, and Scott Mabry signed up to run against me. So there are three of us running. On the Republican side, uh, Tom Clear, who just finished a run for governor and had lost, signed up for, uh, the, gov for the Republican side. And um, uh, Blackhurst, Richard Blackhurst, who had been uh, a lower court judge, I, it was before we had the Metro Court, and he wasn't a municipal judge. I, I can't remember what what judgeship he had. But, but, so there were the five of us getting ready to run. And uh, I kind of like the odds in the Democratic primary uh, with uh, Scott Mabry and Joe Zook running against me. Uh, I, I can make a gringo san sandwich out of myself and just <laughs> <laughs> walk between the two of them. And, uh, uh, but I guess they got together and Joe Zook dropped out. And so uh, there I was uh, running against Scott Mabry. And Scott Mabry, uh, his dad had been governor. His dad had been the chief justice of the Supreme Court. His wife was a well-known artist, Jane Mabry. And uh, Scott uh, had been the sitting uh, probate judge for, for many, many years, was well-known to everyone. And so our work was cut out uh, to, to run this election. So that, that's the first thing I had to do was, was see if I could even get out of the primary election. I remember we were campaigning around, and uh, someone said, well, who's your husband running against? And she says, well, he's not running against anybody. They're running against him. <laughs> he says, well, who is that? And he says, well, Scott Mabry. She says, oh, the Mabry's an old name in New Mexico. And she says, well, you know, Baca's an old name in New Mexico, too. <laughs> so, so uh, I, I was able to win that election. And then Tom Clear won the primary uh, in the, on the Republican side. And so I ran against uh, Tom Clear. 
And so that, uh, in between, uh, I had also, uh, after the uh, Constitutional Convention, I got talked into uh, running for the county commission in Bernalillo County. Marion Cottrell had been a professor at the University of New Mexico and then uh, later a, a, a member of the city council. Bob Werner, who uh, practiced law, still does, with the, um, uh, um, gosh, uh, b -b -b the law firm, uh, drawing a blank. He's up in Santa Fe now, but I'll think of the, uh, Sutton Thayer and Brown. <clears throat> and uh, so we ran as a, 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 a ticket, Cottrell, Werner, and Baca, and we all lost. <laughs> but I learned a lot in that election to sustain me in this second election running for, for the uh, county commission, uh, for the uh, Supreme Court, that, that, uh, for the district court. So uh, no matter what you do, again, experiences, and you learn from that, and, and, and it was very helpful in, in this race. So uh, there's the uh, Constitutional Convention, the county commission, <clears throat> And now the district court primary election, and then the district court. There's four elections right there in a period of a couple of years, so you you can accumulate a thousand. Now I think another interesting thing is uh, when I was in the constitutional convention, our uh, uh, legal advisor was the attorney general's office, and Jim Maloney, who became district judge, was attorney general at the time, and he had a young assistant who had just graduated from Stanford Law School by the. Uh, 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 name of Jeff Bingaman, and uh, Jeff was assigned to the Constitutional Convention. And so uh, he had uh, started working in Santa Fe or in Albuquerque after that. I can't remember who he was practicing law with. And we tried to talk Jeff into running for the county commission with us. And he was going to, and then he and Ann decided to move to Santa Fe, and he practiced law with Jack Campbell up there. And I see him now, and I tell him, you know, Jeff, if you listen to us, you could be county commissioner today. But no, <laughs> no, we had to, had to go on and be United States senator. So uh, uh, then after, after um, the elections were, were over, then you could really sit back and, and start to become a judge. And um, uh, in those days, we, we were not divisionalized. <clears throat> one month you did civil cases, one month you did criminal cases, another month you did domestic relations, and then the next month you did juvenile cases. So every month you did something different. And I'm not sure, I, I know it's much more efficient now to have people doing it and you d develop an expertise, but from my standpoint as, uh, as a judge, I really like the variety. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the variety just when you've had enough criminal uh, law for a while, then you, you step into the civil side and handle those kinds of cases. The domestics were never my favorite. I was always glad to see that month end. But still worthwhile and, and interesting work and important work. Yeah. Uh, when were you appointed by Governor King? I was appointed in March of 1972. What did you like least about being a judge? Uh, initially, what I liked least about being a judge was having to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> you, you, wanted, you wanted to jump in, and, and you had to learn that you, you could not do that. I, um, I don't know. I, uh, I, I think what I liked least about being a district judge was the, uh, the domestic relations docket, handling those kinds of emotional cases. They were very difficult. And, and they were so important, and, and, uh, and uh, people uh, were in such straits at that time, even some extraordinarily prominent people in, in Albuquerque going through the, the throes of a divorce um, started to act strangely, and, and, and it was very difficult to, to try to make some sense out of that and, uh, and to try to, to, uh, to um, come up with solutions that, that well, my theory was if you offended everybody, you probably uh, did justice. And those were in the days before no-fault divorce, correct? Well, no, we, we had no-fault divorce. Yeah, I, as long as I can remember, we've had no-fault divorce. Yeah, it, 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 incompatibility, essentially. Yeah. What did you like most about being a, uh, a, a trial court judge? I, I, 
I like the immediacy of it. I, uh, I uh, like sometimes I, my clock radio would go off in the morning, and I would hear about an accident or a murder or something, and I says that's going to be in my court <laughs> this afternoon, or or before it's all over. So uh, there was a sense you you were in the center of the universe, essentially, the municipal universe of Albuquerque. Uh, everything that happened eventually found its way to to the courthouse, and uh, chances are it would find its way to your particular courtroom. And uh, so it was a very very exciting uh, uh, job. I, I, I enjoyed it very very much. How long did you stay on the district court bench? I was a district judge for 17 and a half years. And uh, in 1988, I ran for the Supreme Court. How did you see the legal profession change during those years as a district court judge? I think, well, obviously there are many, many more lawyers, and we, we saw the progression of lawyers. Uh, when I took the bench, there were eight judges, and it just expanded from six to eight judges. Now there are 20, I, I'm not even sure, 27? Something, Something like, that. like that. So essentially 19 or 20 more judges uh, serving in divisions and, and, uh, and all kinds of masters and, and uh, mediations and these sorts of things. So uh, it, it was a much more um, intimate surrounding, if you will. People tended to know people much better then than they, than they do now. Uh, you I mean think the lawyers? The lawyers. Knew definitely. the lawyers, the judges knew the lawyers, the lawyers exactly. knew the judges? Exactly, yeah. Uh, but much more of a, of a community, although... Uh, when you compare us to other metropolitan areas, uh, you know we're, we're still a relatively cohesive, uh, workable group. So it, it's not totally gotten out of hand. Well, I know that you've had an opportunity since you retired to go around to different legal communities and give talks and presentations as, as part of meetings and seminars and conventions. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've heard from people who are familiar both with the way law is practiced in New Mexico, primarily the Albuquerque area, and the way law is practiced yeah. elsewhere, in other places, they say that it's a more genteel and a friendlier practice uh, and a more collegial atmosphere in New Mexico than other places. Uh, do you have any experience with that? Yeah, I, I think that that is probably correct. I, I, I think the larger and more impersonal it gets, the uh, uh, you're never going to see these people again. Uh, there's a sharpness about the practice. Uh, here, I think uh, still, if you if you are specializing, if you're doing personal injury work, you're going to see the defense lawyers again and again, and they're going to see the plaintiffs' lawyers again and again. So, I think people tend to uh, to uh, to to, uh, uh, to be gentlemen, and ladies about about that. Larger communities, uh, that that's probably not so. Um, I think. Um, how it's changed uh, in terms, al although it's bigger and, and, and it's different, I think one of the, the, the watershed changes in the practice of law, at least from my perspective, was changing from uh, uh, comparative negligence uh, uh, or, or the adoption of comparative negligence as opposed to contributory negligence. Um, when uh, Mary Walters wrote that opinion, and then the Supreme Court followed it with its opinion, uh, the, the, I think there was a watershed difference in, in, in how law is practiced. I think fewer and fewer people actually uh, try cases. I know when we were uh, set up the uh, uh, committees to look into specializations, and you could have a designation as a trial lawyer, many young trial lawyers had a hard time of getting the requisite number of trial hours because now everything goes to mediation or gets settled uh, than did before. But in the old days, uh, we used to try case after case after case and very little settlement. Uh, I'd have a, a, a month of, uh, of civil cases, a civil docket, 
and Gene Cleekin would take half of it, and Leroy Farlow would take the other half, State Farm and, uh, and all state insurance. <laughs> And uh, we'd try uh, rear ender accidents, and they'd win 50% of those. They'd somehow convince the jury that guy sitting there at the stoplight was, was somehow contributorily negligent. And when comparative negligence came in, why, uh, we saw fewer and fewer of those cases being tried, and a lot more going out to, to mediation, or a lot more uh, just being settled. Uh, because uh, you, you couldn't take the chance that, uh, that you were going to zero somebody out. In terms of how the juries worked with the comparative negligence standard and the uh, contributory negligence standard, how, did you see a difference in the way they approached the cases or how they came to their outcomes? Um, th th that's hard to say because you, uh, I, I never quiz the jurors. Uh, I always met with the jurors afterwards because they were always revved up and they, they needed some calming down and they needed some reassurance that they had done what was right. And they, they always asked me, they says, do you think we reached the right decision? And I always used to tell them that I believe in the jury system and any decision you reached was right. <laughs> and <laughs> even if I was appalled by the, <laughs> by, But uh, I, I think yes, I think that uh, clearly that gave uh, jurors an opportunity uh, where there really was some uh, contributory negligence uh, to compare that negligence and to, uh, to try to come out with, uh, if you will, a, um, uh, a verdict that was certainly not going to give everything to one side, something to the other. So, so I, I think, yes, I, I think the jurors were much more comfortable instead of saying absolutely not. Uh, that there, there was a middle ground for them, and, and I think the jurors were much more comfortable working under the guise of, of comparative negligence. In terms of the cases where you sat as a judge, what are the most memorable cases that you have, you handled? Uh, you know, the, everybody asks you that, and I wish I had a great answer. I, there are a couple of cases that, that stand out. Uh, one of them was a civil case, and uh, it was uh, Paula Syroid was the uh, plaintiff, a young girl about 14 years old, and uh, she was driving uh, with her friend in a car. She was the passenger. <clears throat> the interesting thing was that uh, Bruce Hall, who was historically, traditionally, and still to this day one of the premier insurance defense lawyers, was plaintiff's counsel. <laughs> Rhodey had a, a plaintiff's case. And they had appealed the case to the Supreme Court before I got it, trying to get comparative negligence adopted. And in a 5-4 decision, uh, Justice McManus dissenting, uh, the, uh, comparative negligence was not adopted by the Supreme Court. Later it was adopted by the Court of Appeals and then affirmed by the Supreme Court. So it came back to me for trial. And it involved, um, when this area in Albuquerque, the Northeast Heights, uh, the end of Osuna at about Eubank was being developed. And there was the Albuquerque, um, a plant that made concrete, Albuquerque Concrete Company. It was on one side, it had a private road where the public road ended. And these young girls were driving there. And it was dark at night. And they drove off the pavement, and the car turned over. And Paula Syroid uh, had head injuries and uh, was uh, essentially a vegetable case after that. And uh, so the lawsuit was brought against the owners of the property, the concrete company, uh, I think the city. I forget. There were a number of plaintiffs. It was a complex case. And, and it was so well tried. Uh, Bruce was there, and... Um, um, gosh, defense counsel with Iden and Johnson, Palantis, Jim Palantis, and I forget there was someone else, but extremely talented, good, competitive lawyers. And it had a lot of uh, very interesting uh, legal and evidentiary issues. Uh, they wanted to show what uh, the end of the pavement looked like 
And so they reproduced a car with, with some lights on it and took movies. And I had to make some decision. Of course, the defense counsel was objecting. Plaintiffs were saying this is demonstrative of what it looks like. And it was something new in those days. It was some new innovative ways of presenting evidence. Uh, then the uh, defense counsel wanted us to look at the car to see if Paula Syroid uh, was, uh, they were uh, traveling too fast and she could see uh, the speedometer. And, and so did we allow them to go down in the parking lot and, and sit in the car and, and see this? And so it, it presented a lot of interesting new uh, evidentiary qu questions. It was like a Harvard Law School torts exam, evidence <laughs> exam. And uh, but so well tried. And uh, eventually uh, the, the, it went to jury and the jury came back with a verdict and, and uh, we put that in the trust. And, and, um, and, uh, and it, it used to come back every, every year for me to approve expenditures. By that time, uh, young Paula was uh, at the Los Lunas Training School and was receiving monies from the trust. So that, that was, because uh, it was so well tried, the novel issues that were presented uh, sticks in my memory as, as one outstanding plaintiff's defense case that, that was tried. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think maybe on the criminal side, um, uh, the uh, Phil Chacon murder case. Phil Chacon was a police officer, and uh, he was um, visiting uh, a, uh, a home for uh, abused women on Central Avenue. And he was on his private motorcycle in civilian clothes. And somebody said the Kinney's shoe store on Central Avenue has just been robbed and the guys are speeding away. And so he ran out and jumped on his motorcycle and, and chased them. And as he was chasing them, somebody shot him and killed him. And then these people were uh, arrested and one of them was Van Bering Robinson. And uh, uh, Steve Schiff was DA and he personally prosecuted the case and Jim Toulouse was defense counsel. And it was the only death penalty case that I ever tried. And uh, we picked a jury in a half a day for a death penalty case. You can imagine, you could not do that today. That's, that's one of the big changes. Uh, we did that. And um, it, it had every surprise in it that you can imagine. People changing their testimony, <clears throat> having to threaten people in contempt of court, uh, all, all sorts of things that, uh, that occurred uh, in this trial. And it was a very emotional thing. And uh, it was the only time in my life without dieting that I lost weight. <laughs> and uh, so that, that's, that's how, how, uh, how emotional it was. Eventually the jury came back. They found uh, Robinson guilty. Uh, they did not impose the death penalty. It went up on appeal and it got reversed, and it came back. And I think he pled to, to something else, and that, that was. But uh, that that uh, it was in the uh, papers every day. It was on television every night. It was uh, the city was buzzing about it because a police officer had been killed. Yeah, I remember that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you were talking about some of your more interesting cases. How about some of the more interesting lawyers that <laughs> appeared in front of you? Interesting lawyers. Uh, Jim Toulouse. <laughs> Why did uh, I know you Jim, were going to tell me that? <laughs> Jim was an uh, extraordinarily gifted lawyer. Uh, really, uh, really knew how to relate to a jury, rumbling around. You remember Jim was, <clears throat> was a very, very large man. And in his later days, uh, had terrible arthritis of the knees. And I remember we were trying one case, and uh, Jim had come across something called ubuterol, which was horse liniment, put it on his knees. And he would, may I approach the bench, and I'd call him up and, and counsel to come up, and he'd approach the bench, and there was this stench of ubuterol that smelt like onions or garlic. <laughs> and after that, I said, don't approach the bench quite as close. <laughs> <laughs> and I went home that night, and I could taste it. It permeated my pores. I could taste <laughs> the, the, as the smell. But other than that, and we used to kid Jim about <laughs> that 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 that, uh, that cure for for his arthritic knees. 
But uh, yeah, Jim was a, a classic trial lawyer who understood juries, uh, who uh, took on a lot of cases, as the Van Berry and Robinson case, cases other people wouldn't touch, where he knew people who were entitled to representation, and, and uh, by golly, he was going to do it. Th those that were most in need, and, and uh, very, very uh, champion of the uh, black community in, in, uh, in, in Albuquerque. And it was a saint to them. Hmm. So Jim was really an interesting uh, trial lawyer. Who else stands out in your mind? Well, uh, there uh, in Santa Fe, when I was in the district attorney's office, there was O. Russell Jones, Jones Guy Ego Sneed and Wertheim Law Firm. And uh, Russ Jones um, was an interesting guy. He'd come out to New Mexico from Illinois, I think, and he had gotten his law degree from an old night law school run by the uh, YMCA in Chicago. It probably doesn't exist anymore. There, there were a whole series of uh, night law schools run by the YMCA that had been subsumed into other law schools now. <clears throat> and that was one of them. And he came out as an FBI agent during the Second World War to work at Los Alamos. He was one of the, the guards, or the, one of the, the person who did security work up there. And then liked it and took the bar and then started practicing law in Santa Fe and uh, had a, a series of young lawyers that worked for him and then he was such a, a demanding guy that they'd all leave after a while until uh, Bill Sneed and, and Jerry Wertheim stuck with him and then formed this, this uh, fabulous law firm that they have now. But he was an extraordinary trial lawyer. He was a tall, slender guy that had a 10-gallon hat and a rose in his lapel. That was his, uh, <laughs> his calling card. And uh, always when he was trying, and he tried criminal defense cases, uh, and uh, always was able to bring him before the jury the fact that he'd been an FBI agent, <laughs> which gave him <laughs> gravitas with, with the jury. And, um, a, and we talk about theories of picking juries. And he used to say, give me 12 jurors. I don't care who they are. He never ex exercised a challenge against a juror. The first 12 out of the box, he didn't care who it was, he was going to win. That was his attitude, and pretty much he did. But he, he was uh, one of the finest trial lawyers that I, I have seen. What makes a fine trial lawyer, from your perspective, being on both sides of the bench? Well, I think there's some God-given attributes that one has, but that isn't enough. Hard work, really hard work, knowing your case thoroughly knowing the legal issues that, that are involved, knowing that. Uh, and then uh, being aggressive without being obnoxious, not allowing anything to get by, but being able to object to it in, in a gracious way, being able to make your point forcefully but not obnoxiously. And then I think uh, being able to bring the jury along with you, that you're every man, that you're one of them, that you're, you're, your interests are, are, uh, coincide with those of the jury, uh, that you're not some sort of uh, slick sort of monster out there, and, and being able to sell yourself to the jury. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you the same question about being a judge. <laughs> What makes somebody a great judge? Uh, keeping your mouth shut, <laughs> letting the lawyers try their case, uh, respecting the lawyers and their ability. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, also uh, running a tight ship, promptness, starting on time, moving the case along. Uh, if things are, are Time is being wasted. You're wasting the jury's time. You're wasting the judge's time, the lawyer's time. Uh, being able to move the case along, uh, you have to have a thorough understanding of the case and the issues. And uh, in complex cases that aren't, uh, you know, uh, garden variety uh, cases that uh, we, we try all the time, being able to to uh, fully understand what the law is, the complexities of the law, and being able to, being unafraid to make a decision, even, even in areas that are unclear, the law is not settled, 
or the facts are could go one way or the other, they're paying you to, to make that decision. And that's what they want you to do, make the decision. And then in a non-jury case, not holding the verdict forever, not taking it under advisement and never telling anybody what you're... Decide the case. It's not going to get any better. And you're never going to know any more about the case until, uh, as you do right then. And there are cases that you look at the file when it comes before you and you wonder, how in the world am I going to decide that? Uh, this is so difficult, and, and it's not clear on one side or another. And there's a, 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 a term that I heard, I think, at judges' school, that your judicial bell gets rung. And invariably, in other, every case that I ever tried, at some point, my judicial bell got rung and the fog cleared. And you knew what was right in that case. Tell me more about that. I, I think it's uh, the, the, the case is so close to begin with. The law is close. The facts are close. The ability of the lawyers in presenting it are close. And one thing, you, you listen to one side and you say, that's, that's true. And then you listen to the other side and you say, well, okay. And, uh, and you're going back and forth in your own mind. As, as you're trying the case, you're taking notes. You're trying to understand the case. You're, you're trying to figure out. I'm talking about a, a, a non-jury case that you're going to have to decide yourself and do findings of fact and conclusions of law. And um, you're going through this and uh, you're wondering how, at the end, am I going to reach a rational decision about this? And in every instance, at some point, something happened, uh, a witness testified, a piece of evidence came in, uh, somehow something coalesced and it, it clarified in your mind and, uh, and the judicial bell got rung and, and you knew at the end uh, what... Now, hopefully you were right in all of these. <laughs> but in your own mind, if you were right, I guess that was good enough. <laughs> How did you feel about getting reversed? Uh, I... I actually, <laughs> when I got reversed, uh, I never really recognized the case. <laughs> it, it had been reworked when it went to the Court of Appeals of the Supreme Court. And, and uh, essentially, when I read the opinion, I says, I don't remember trying this case. <laughs> that, that's kind of superficial. I don't, I don't really mean that. Uh, how did you feel? Uh, well, uh, and, and sometimes you agreed with, uh, they, they brought something to your attention. Or in one case, I ruled one way, and I really didn't want to rule that way. It was, a, a, it was a, uh, an, uh, an infringement case. And uh, I would have ruled one way, but I thought the law had gone this way. But nobody had ever argued the law that way, the way I wanted it to go. And it went up to the uh, Court of Appeals and on appeal, somebody had unearthed a case that stood for how I would have decided the case. So in that instance, I was very happy to see that case <laughs> reversed because I never liked my decision to begin with. Uh, the, the Van Berrien Robinson case, uh, I was reversed on that in something that took about 22 seconds out of 21 days of trial time. So, <laughs> so who knows, uh, that one, uh, I, I agreed with the decision. No, actually, they didn't plead. We tried it again. And uh, there was a conviction of, uh, of uh, the death penalty was not in the case at that point. And so there, there was a, a conviction after that. So I, who knows? So you, 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 well, you never take uh, personally what a court of appeals does. Because you try so, so many cases, and uh, the vast majority of them are never appealed. The few that do get appealed, only fewer yet get spun around. And so uh, you just have to take it with a grain of salt and, and uh, learn from that. And uh, so I, I never took it personally. You brought something up that I think a lot of lawyers think about, and that is that how does the judge deal with the temptation 
of following existing precedent when you really believe that either the law is wrong or the way the facts need to be applied to the wrong, the law is incorrect. Yeah. Well, stare decisis, we, we're all bound by stare decisis, and as a trial judge, uh, you, even if you disagree with uh, the decisions of, of the court or how the law has, has evolved, uh, you are still obligated to follow whatever the law is. And so uh, in, 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 in that case, that uh, uh, it wasn't a patent infringement, it was a uh, 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 sales uh, infringement, an area of, of, of infringement, uh, which doesn't, th that whole concept doesn't exist anymore, that somebody has a right <laughs> to exclusive jurisdiction to sell something here. And um, uh, so I, I think that th that's it, that it, 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 you have to understand your function and your role as a trial judge. That's why it was so interesting to go to the Supreme Court when uh, <laughs> then you could write on a clean slate if you, if, but still, you're bound by stare decisis and, and, and precedent. You cannot be a, a cowboy. You cannot be crazy. You cannot throw out precedent. You, you need to follow precedent. And if, you're, if, if precedent does not exist, or if there is competing precedent somewhere else, and it's never been adopted in New Mexico, then that's the greatest opinion to write, because then you have choices. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was uh, interviewing Justice Franchini, uh, he talked about uh, the case that caused him to make the decision to retire from the bench. It was a sentencing issue. Yes. Uh, did you ever run across something like that that it had such a strong impact on you? Not, no. I, uh, not to the extent that I, uh, I would uh, uh, resign. Uh, I, I know Gene felt very strongly about uh, the young man using a gun and uh, the discretion of the court uh, the legislature had, had, uh, had uh, assumed the discretion this court had no discretion under the statute <clears throat> and he had to be sent to the penitentiary for a prescribed number of years and uh, he was not willing to do that and, and felt very strongly about that but uh, I the one, one has to, I think, understand the separation of powers as the framers of the Constitution have uh, have written it in our Constitution and the, and the federal Constitution. And uh, the legislature has certain powers, the judiciary has certain powers, the executive has certain powers. And I, as a judge or as a governor or a legislator, you need to function in your sphere of influence. And, and uh, so uh, understanding that, there are certain decisions that I had to make because the law was that way. I would have liked to have uh, decided something else, but uh, but but nothing quite as dramatic as uh, as Gene felt. You mentioned something before that I found very interesting. You said after a trial was over, you would always go and talk to the jury, not so much to find out what they or how they ruled or what was important to them, but to kind of calm them down and bring them back mm -hmm. down a little bit. And you talked about them needing to be reassured that what they did was right. They would ask you, did we do the right thing? Um, where does that come from? Could you talk to us a little bit more about that? Maybe give us some insight as to how juries do what juries do? Yeah. I, always, I was always appreciative of juries. I thought it was a huge imposition that we call people from off the street, <laughs> sit them down in this room <laughs> and bring the most horrible circumstances and, and with no training or except for a little film that we showed him beforehand, said, okay, <laughs> decide it. I mean, decide a man's life, decide a man's fortune, uh, just do it. And, and that is an enormous responsibility. And I found that, that, that uh, jurors really took it very seriously, even, even in some of the, uh, what we considered the lesser cases. The, 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 they, they, uh, they really took it seriously and worked hard at it. And I was very appreciative of that. I was appreciative of jurors because many times you had a jury pool sitting in the, the jury assembly room and you're getting ready to try a case that morning. 
And they came in and they said, Judge, we've reached a plea agreement, or Judge, uh, we, uh, uh, we're going to pay so much money and, and we're, we're, this is going to go away. And then, then the jury uh, clerk goes out there and tells the jury, go home. I never allowed that to happen. I would go talk to them and i say, those of you who stand and wait also serve. <laughs> and, and tell them, you are here ready, willing, and able to be called in to act as jurors and to decide this case. And because you are here, these people, their hands were forced and they, they thought better of that and they decided to settle this case. So even though you never saw these people, you never heard a word of testimony, you're responsible for having this case settled and decided and the, the government's business and the people's business to, to continue on. And so I always appreciated that. So I, I always felt very strongly about the care and feeding of jurors because I thought they, they, uh, we paid them minimum wage and and uh, they ought not to have maximum attitude. You know, so we, <laughs> <laughs> and so carrying further, when they actually did the work, they actually set through the trial, it was very emotional for them. I've never sat on a jury. I was called for jury duty one time. I was never picked. But my wife served on a jury, and she told me how difficult that was and, and how seriously everybody took it and how wound up they are at the end. And I've, I've spoken to jurors who have gone home and that literally become violently ill, physically ill. And so I always thought there, a bit of decompression was, was good for them. So after they had reached their decision, I'd call them into my chambers and sit around and say, uh, do you have any questions? Is there anything I can answer? And I said, there are certain things that I can't answer. But and invariably they said, well, did you agree with our verdict? That's always <laughs> the first question. And I gave them that stock answer. Yeah. It seems as though that question begs an interpretation. And that is that maybe they were feeling somewhat insecure about their jobs or you know, their jobs as jurors or the verdict that they reached, that there's an element of insecurity in that question. Sure, there is. And uh, there are 12 people making the decision. And they may have to talk somebody into it and, and bring them along. And uh, so th that's the majority verdict, or that's the 10-2 uh, the, the, the or, or 12-0 uh, verdict. But in the 10-2, uh, they may be talking to those two folks over there. Or in the 12-0, the folks who really didn't want to go along with it and, and eventually got talked into it. And so they may they want the imprimatur of the, the court to say, yeah, that's, you did the right thing. Uh, but yes, I, I, I think that uh, one could do a study, do a psychological study uh, just on the questions that jurors ask or the feelings that they have or the emotions that they feel because uh, it is a human process. It is a difficult human process. It is an emotional, gut-wrenching uh, human process and we, and we impose on people and just bring them in and say, do it. Did, did you find that many of the jury verdicts were compromised verdicts? On the civil side. On the civil side. On the civil about. side, compromised verdicts. I don't think that they were compromised verdicts necessarily, although they definitely could have been. Uh, I, the the uh, 17 and a half years that I was a trial judge, I, I read about huge verdicts now. And I can't believe it because I never saw any huge verdicts. Phil Biomonte used to have a theory, Judge Biomonte, about Albuquerque juries. And uh, he would say if the Pope was driving down I-40, and if, in those days, it was the Ayatollah Khomeini, it would probably be Osama bin Laden, was driving the wrong way, drunk the other direction, hit the car and killed the Pope head on. And you had a jury of 12 Catholics in Albuquerque that they were going to give the Pope's estate all the money in the world, which was $160,000. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so uh, I, I think that... that uh, now I, I read about, about enormous verdicts, million-dollar verdicts that, that never existed when I was a, a trial judge, just didn't exist. 
And I, I was doing a mediation the other day, and there was an out-of-state uh, lawyer involved in it, and we were talking about, you know, you're trying to talk some sense <laughs> expectations down. And uh, he had a theory about Albuquerque. He says, well, I look at the house prices in Albuquerque, and he says, that's real money. And, and people uh, understand uh, economics in Albuquerque. And I said, oh, <laughs> I guess we do have expensive house prices here. Uh, so uh, I'm not so sure that I saw, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that there were compromise verdicts. Uh, but what I saw were, were fairly traditional uh, verdicts that were conservative in, 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 in the, the high figures that represented what, uh, what my assessment of the community was at that time. And I think the community has changed become somewhat more affluent, uh, more sophisticated, uh, and maybe the lawyers are better. I, I don't know, but uh, the, the, I, I now read about big verdicts that, that did not exist when I was a trial judge. In personal injury cases, what's the major mistake that plaintiff's attorneys make? Oh, my. <laughs> not settling. <laughs> Yeah, and then they get to trial. Um, major mistakes. I, I I don't know if I can say there is one major mistake. Um, Let's make it plural then. I I think one thing I saw was that jurors were left on their own to assess damages that, that they were asking for. And I think it would have been more effective if the lawyers could have talked about the varying uh, elements of damages and then quantify them in some way for the jury to get their arms around and then to say, I want you to bring in a verdict for thus and so. Because I, I think I saw jurors in personal injury cases that were going to find for the plaintiff and struggling with, uh, with a range of, uh, of, of dollars. And uh, had uh, the... Uh, now, I understand there, there might be a theory that once you've mentioned an amount, you've capped what you think and, and you... You've, uh, you, you've, uh, there, there might be an outside chance that the, you'll get the jumbo verdict. So is that a mistake? I don't know. But I always thought that uh, guidance, more guidance from plaintiff's counsel in terms of evaluation of the case <clears throat> and what you wanted them to do. Instructions beyond the instructions that you get. Mm -hmm. Because the instructions are nebulous, uh, pain and suffering, um, uh, you know, future losses of earnings. Somehow the loss of earnings we do get an economist that reduces the present cash value and talks about that and so forth. Do jurors ever talk to you about the jury instructions as to whether they're helpful, whether they're not helpful, whether they're more confusing than they are helpful? I cannot... Well, I, I, we, we got questions from jurors when they were deliberating asking for a clarification. And then essentially the answer back was read the instruction again. <laughs> so uh, that was not helpful. So I, I think that there was, uh, there has to be. Jury instructions just have to be confusing. Uh, by, I mean, I, I, I used to sit there and read these things and, and it's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and there, there were a pile of them there. Uh, and and, and uh, because they were they were designed by committee, and uh, the horse became the camel, and that's that's what we give them <laughs> the camel to, to try to, to to decide. Because you had plaintiffs' lawyers and defense lawyers, and, and then you had the academics on the, in, in the middle of it, and trying to come up with something that, that would instruct the jury. So I, I I don't recall, except for the the questions back when they were deliberating, saying, "My gosh, that was a hodgepodge," and how do you expect us to do justice reading that? Did not get that question, but my sense is that, that even my reading them to them, uh, I was apologetic. Did you have a sense that the jurors 
eventually understood the instructions and followed them? Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Surprisingly, <laughs> even in complex, very complex cases. And, uh, and even in, um, well, in, in, in criminal cases where there's step-down instructions and, and, and multiple counts. Uh, I, I was always amazed because I'd always read the verdicts before I'd ever announce them to anybody to make sure that they were not conflicting with each other and they were in proper form. And I do not recall ever that they, it wasn't something that wasn't a finished job when I got it. But I had to send it back. You talked about a couple of attorneys earlier on who were just great at relating to jurors. Uh, what qualities did they have that some of the rest of us seem to be have in short supply. <laughs> well, another couple I, I, I'm thinking of is Chuck Larrabee and Jim Ritchie uh -huh. as, as uh, defense lawyers. Unfailing gentlemen, gracious, old school, uh, but tougher than nails, <laughs> mm -hmm. very demanding. And, uh, and uh, I, I think um, if there's one thing that I saw that we, we all don't have the same gifts to, to, to make a presentation. We, we all cannot make the stirring, spellbinding, closing argument and so forth. But we all can put in the requisite time. And, and I think that's what I see or saw is that uh, some cases got short shrift and, and there, there was not enough thought or effort or time put into them to, to make them sterling as, as they should be. And, that, and so that, that, might, that might be, if I was talking to young lawyers that were going to go into trial practice, is you really need to put, uh, there's no shortcut. You don't want to hear that. It's like people running for office, they tell you, how'd you do it? It's, it's, uh, you work running for public office as a judge, you, you act as if Oliver Wendell Holmes is your opponent and you're seven votes behind. <laughs> and, and, and it's the same way with, with trying the case. Uh, you just have to make sure that you know everything about that case and there are no surprises and that you've uh, done the discovery, you've done the work, you understand it, and, and you're ready to go. Is that the old saw about 98% preparation, 2% inspiration? I think that's right. I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. All right. Be uh, because, uh, uh, again, there, there, there's certain abilities and, and certain presence that people have and, and others just don't have it. But they, that doesn't mean they can't be good trial lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, what I'd like to do next is to go into your uh, process of getting to the Supreme Court. But before I do that is, before we leave the judgeship area, is there anything else that you can think of that you'd like to share with us regarding your perception about being a judge, regarding your perception of jurors, parties, lawyers? No, I, I think we've covered it pretty well. Um, I uh, just feel that I was uh, very fortunate to have had the opportunity to, to be a trial. Uh, I, I would have liked to have been a trial lawyer, I think, longer. Uh, I think... Uh, if I had any regrets, it would have been that I became a judge too young. I was 35 years old at the time, and I, I talk to people now <clears throat> who want to go on the bench, and it seems to me they're going on the bench younger and younger. But I, I try to talk them out of it. I, I said, uh, you need to get your financial house in order. You need to get a, a broad spectrum of experience. and uh, but. When you do that, you're probably at the height of your earning years, and, and, and a judgeship is not that attractive <laughs> at that point. So there, there's a trade-off. But uh, I, I think that's the only regret that I have is that I went on so young that I, I wished I, 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 I should have practiced for another 10 years. New Mexico has a reputation of having young judges. Well, uh, it does now. Vern Payne was appointed, uh, he and I were born in 1936, he's three months older than me, and he was appointed to judge uh, six months before me, or he, he was elected actually before me. And uh, it, it, it was almost a scandal that Vern Payne was, was a, a trial judge at that point. 
And then I was appointed, and, and uh, Bruce King received some criticism for appointing someone 35 years old. After that, he appointed uh, uh, George Bettis at 30 and Stanley Frost at 32, so, or 31, I think. So, uh, it, and uh, constitutionally, I think you had to be 30 years old to be a judge. So, so uh, but now, yes, now, but, but up to that point, uh, people were at mid-career before they became uh, judges. You were talking about what it was like being a judge. Uh, there are people nowadays that are talking about and being very critical about the ju judicial system and the judges and that the judges are too liberal and that the judges are not following the law and the, the judges are creating their own law and that our judicial system is broken. It sounds like from what you've been talking about that you wouldn't agree with those positions. What are your thoughts? I, uh, my experience, I, 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 my experience of the people I interacted with as judges uh, of all sorts of political persuasions, if you will, uh, and, and backgrounds and uh, practice areas and this sort of thing, uh, really uh, worked hard at at delivering justice, which is what we're, I mean, it's almost sophomoric to say it, but that's, that's really what we're all about. And, and so I, I think that, uh, that uh, the system, while not, certainly not above criticism, certainly not above improvement in many areas, uh, that, um, that uh, uh, it, I think we're very lucky that we, 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 we've, uh, there are a lot of good people who have come through the system who have uh, devoted themselves to public service, and uh, I, I think we're very fortunate. Now, um, uh, there's a lot of debate about philosophies and interpretations and, and, and this sort of thing, and, and it, it will probably ca carry us well beyond the time that we have allotted. <laughs> before we, uh, again, before we go into the uh, Supreme Court part of your life, <clears throat> um, tell us about your family, your wife, your kids. Well, I, uh, I've been married to Dorothy since uh, 1969. We'll, be, uh, uh, we'll uh, celebrate our 40th anniversary next year. On the 28th of June, we're coming up fairly close to the, our 39th anniversary. Uh, Dorothy uh, was, uh, uh, she was a teacher when we met and married. And uh, then our first daughter was born, JoLynn. She's our oldest daughter. And then Dorothy uh, quit working and uh, stayed home for 14 years and uh, was a stay-at-home mom. Uh, I had two daughters after that. They're, they're far apart. They're, uh, they're um, uh, four years apart. And that's because I ran every six years and you had to have an adorable uh, two-year-old to campaign <laughs> with. And that's, that's how we... So, so every, every campaign we had to... <laughs> uh, I have three daughters. Uh, my oldest daughter, Jill Lynn, uh, graduated from the University of New Mexico and uh, uh, worked out in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, she had a degree in broadcast journalism and uh, really wanted to be an actress. And so she left Los Angeles and went to New York, and she's still pursuing, still chasing the dream of being an actress in New York. And, and uh, to keep body and soul together, she works as a, a personal trainer and uh, makes jewelry and goes to auditions. and. Uh, every now and then gets a part here and a part there and toured with a couple of companies uh, you know, worldwide. And so she's still following that, that dream. Then I have a middle daughter, uh, Andrea, and she lives in Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, she works for the Bank of America in marketing. And uh, she graduated from the University of New Mexico and has a degree in, in uh, psychology. And uh, with that, she... Uh, went to New York to be with my older daughter because she, what are you going to do with a degree in psychology? So when she got there, JoLynn got hired as a, an actress in a, a company and left New York. And there was Andrea with the apartment and rent to pay and no job. So she went to work for a temp agency and they hired her answering phones for somebody who was on maternity leave at an ad agency way downtown. You could see the Statue of Liberty out her, uh, out her window. And uh, so she started... Uh, 
we got bored answering the phone, asked for work to do, and when the lady came back, they said, well, you're pretty good. Would you be interested in working in an ad agency? And so she's parlayed that and then uh, worked for an Hispanic advertising firm in uh, Houston, Lopez Negrete, and her client was the Bank of America, and then the Bank of America said, come to work for us. Then my third daughter, Anna Marie, is in Washington, D.C., and she graduated from George Washington Law School in 2005, uh, three years ago and uh, <clears throat> worked for a uh, big firm in the summer, decided she didn't want to <laughs> work for a big firm. And uh, another summer, she did a part of a summer at uh, FEMA. And uh, so uh, this is before Katrina. And then when she graduated, Katrina happened. And uh, they, they called her and uh, said, would you, be, would you like to come to work for us? And so she really liked government. She liked politics. And so she is a legislative attorney for FEMA, and they got a lot to answer for. And so she says, the only bad thing about that, it's a bad pickup line to go into a bar, say, I'm a lawyer from FEMA. And said, nobody, <laughs> nobody will buy you a drink. So. <laughs> but, Particularly but, not in New Orleans. Not, not in New Orleans, no. Uh, what does your wife Dorothy think? of your political odyssey? Well, she's been uh, a great supporter. And uh, she has uh, worked so hard in, in every one of the campaigns and, uh, and has really made things happen for us. It's been a very leveling influence. And uh, uh, she, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I, I can't say that she enjoys the political process or revels in the political process, but, uh, but, but she has a real interest in the political process as well. And so it, it's, been a, it, it's been a partnership. And, and so I've been very, very lucky. Very lucky. Okay, so let's go off the record. Okay. This is in take two. Gosh, we're going too long, aren't we? Oh, this is great. It's the beginning of tape three. All right, Justice Baca. Now we're going to go to the Supreme <laughs> Court. Supreme Court, all right. Tell us how you got there. Well, it was 1988, and I was in the middle of a term on the uh, district bench, and I was about uh, five years away from, uh, from vesting in my retirement. And uh, Mary Walters announced that she was going to retire from the court. Uh, Mary, had, in the interim, had been uh, appointed uh, to the Supreme Court. And uh, so um, I decided that although I liked the trial court, I thought it might be time after 17 and a half years to, to move on and, and, and go to the Supreme Court. I wasn't sure that I was going to like the work of the Supreme Court. I, uh, I enjoyed the uh, the trial bench and uh, but I thought well uh, it, it's going to be an open seat and, and I'll run for it and in those days is before we uh, selected judges the way we do <clears throat> so I decided I'm going to go ahead and and, uh, and run for it so but in the interim Pat Serna had announced that he was running for the seat Petra Maes announced that she was running for it and Stanley Frost was going to run for it so and then I was going to run for it. So there were three Hispanics and one Anglo, and so uh, and uh, Rudy Apodaca was also looking at <laughs> at running for it. So Rudy called me up to Santa Fe one time, and he said, uh, "You know, we're just going to cut each other up, and and uh, what we ought to do is draw straws and see if uh, uh, see who who should run for this seat. Do you, Pat, Petra, or I?" And I said, "Well, Rudy, I don't know about you. I says, but uh, this is my time." Uh, my stars are in alignment. It's the middle of my term. I got five years uh, for retirement. If I don't like it, I can stand anything for five years. Uh, but I'm, I'm running, and so he decided not to run. But the, the other, uh, the three, decided to run. So there we go. 
and we're uh, running against each other. And um, I knew Pat Serna. He was an assistant. Uh, he, he was a probation officer when I was assistant district attorney in Santa Fe. And uh, since that time, in the 60s, people have been confusing Pat and I. They think we look alike which really offends me because I think I'm better looking than that. <laughs> but there we are. I have no comment. <laughs> I know, I know. No. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, Pat had been out campaigning for quite a while. And then I started campaigning, and I'd go to places, and they'd say, well, uh, weren't you here before? And I'd say, no, 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 that was Pat Serna. And then I'd go to another place, and they said, well, you are here to see us last month. And I got to thinking, well, yeah. I'd say, yes, I was. <laughs> <laughs> this is I enjoyed talking to you so much, I decided to come back again. <laughs> Baca's the name of Baca. Well, anyway, we, uh, we, we had this primary fight to, uh, to, to go through. And uh, it, uh, it, it was fairly nip and tuck. And I, uh, I pretty much, uh, Channel 7 used to have a poll that they came out with. And this was one of the, case, one of the uh, races that they were, were following. And I pretty much was leading, uh, and then Stanley Frost uh, came into some money and uh, got some television time. In those days, got $10,000 worth of television time, which would get you one commercial today, but, but he could pretty well saturate the market for a short period of time. And his numbers just started moving, and uh, it, it was going to be a tough race. I remember... Uh, this is an interesting story. I was down on the east side, which was Stanley Frost territory, and I was at a dinner honoring a woman who had served in the Constitutional Convention with me, and she was retiring, Agnes uh, Kastner Head, uh, retiring from her newspaper business. And I went down there, and all the politicians were there, and I couldn't get the time of day. They just loved Stanley down there. They just didn't love me at all. <clears throat> the next morning, I came downstairs for breakfast at the motel, and Bruce King and uh, Dave Cargo were there having breakfast. And I says, boy, I wasted my time coming here. I says, I can't get a vote. And Dave Cargo, he says, oh, no. He says, you never waste your time. He says, on your way home, he says, stop over in Hobbs. He says, there is a, an African-American minister there, and he's a good friend of mine, and uh, he has a community of people of three or 400 and uh, they looked to him for guidance, and uh, he's, he's, you know, the leader of the community. And if you could get, uh, you know, if he, if he likes you and he puts in a good word, you, you might pick up a few votes there. So I did, and I went to see him and visited with him, and he says, well, if Dave Cargo sent you by, I guess you're a good guy and this and that. And so election night, um, we're tied. <laughs> And it wasn't for 24 hours after the primary election that the election was decided. As it turns out, out of 160,000 votes cast, I won by 380 votes. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think it was visiting <laughs> in Hobbs. <laughs> but I, I looked down there, and I, I got about 300 votes out of Lee County. <laughs> so, so who knows? Who knows? Uh, so uh, you, you never waste your time. You go visit everybody. You, uh, you do these things. So... Uh, I think, uh, interestingly enough, is that we all remained friends, and we all served on the Supreme Court together. Stanley next came to the court. I even called Bruce King for him and uh, said, you ought to appoint Stanley Frost. He's a good guy, and so he appointed Stanley Frost. Not, not because I said so, but, but I, I did put in a word for him. And then Pat and, uh, and Petra Maes were eventually elected. We all served together on the court. And, and, uh, and then uh, later on, uh, when Stanley uh, became very ill, he, he came down with melanoma cancer, and uh, he it was terminal, and so he was leaving the court. And under our structure of how you become chief justice, he was never going to become chief justice. And I told him, I said, and I'd, I'd learned this from a judge in Georgia who had done the same thing. And I said, Stanley, I'm going to step down as chief for a month and let you be chief for a month. And I did, and uh, and now his his portrait appears in the Hall of Chiefs. Ah, uh, that's so, wonderful. So, he, so there, we we did remain good friends through, through this whole process. It sounds like there was a fair amount of camaraderie on the Supreme Court while you were sitting there, at least in the early years. Uh, yes, there was. Yeah, uh, when I first got there, it was uh, somewhat of a rocky go uh, with some of the personalities. Uh, some folks left. 
it settled down, and it was it was a, a marvelous experience, a very collegial body, and uh, it was, and, and that that was the other thing when I, when I didn't know whether I, uh, going back to my call, my law school days. Uh, the the beauty and majesty of the law was lost on me. How many uh, angels could dance on the head of a pin was was of no interest <laughs> to me, and uh, the, the trial court seemed to be more suited to me. But when I left the court, it was like somebody quit hitting you on the head with a hammer, and it felt so good. You you didn't realize how wound up you are on the trial bench, and, and the immediacy of it, the people in front of you, and the the conflict that, that needs to be settled right right now. And on the Supreme Court, it was more reflective. It was uh, time to think, time to uh, read and, and to write and to research and, uh, and to really put your imprimatur on how the law develops. And it, it turned out to be another absolutely wonderful job. Uh, and and I, I enjoyed it and, and interacted with my law clerks. I had 20 law clerks over the 13 and a half years I was on the court and young people and mentoring them and, and uh, I just returned from a wedding from one of them in California. So they're, they're still good friends, very successful and virtually every one of them is still uh, in the law field. None of them are massage therapists or doing something else there. They're still, uh, still practicing law. Without breaching any confidences, uh, can you talk to us about what the process is in the Supreme Court? how you decide cases, that type of thing. The uh, Supreme Court, um, cases are assigned on a random basis, unlike the Supreme Court of the United States. That is, authorships are as assigned on a random basis. So when the, ca uh, the uh, calendar comes out for next month, uh, you know what cases you're going to be writing the opinion for. On the Supreme Court of the United States, the Chief Justice uh, listens and determines who's in the majority, who's in the minority, and then assigns the case. So there's no such power on the Supreme Court. The clerk actually randomly assigns the cases. So you know what case you're going to be uh, responsible for writing. And, um, and if you happen to be in the minority, or uh, even when the vote is taken after you've heard oral arguments, uh, you still make a, a stab at writing the majority opinion and trying to win somebody over. So you go to oral argument knowing that you're going to be the author of, uh, of an opinion. You listen to oral arguments, and then you come back. And you go into the, uh, into the robing room. And then you go around the, the bench, or the, around the table. The, the, the youngest, the newest justice speaks first and tells how he or she would decide the case. And then the next senior, and the next senior, the next senior to the senior justice, the chief justice, and then to the author. The author is the last to speak. And so you, you have the lay of the land, how, the, uh, how people are coming down on, on this. And essentially you've uh, decided the case right there. Essentially you know that it's going to be affirmed, it's going to be reversed. You don't know exactly how, but you know uh, how it's going to be. And the interesting thing is... Um, you have decided the case, and all of a sudden there's this release of energy of the lawyers who are there before you. And you can hear them out there talking and laughing, and they really don't know that you've sent them down the tubes already. <laughs> and they won't know for three or four months till, <laughs> till they get the opinion. But, uh, but uh, the cases essentially are decided immediately after oral argument, in the main. Then you uh, write an opinion, and you have taken copious notes about what everybody has said as the author. And if somebody has a particular take on it or has a particular interest in, in something, then you want to write your opinion to make sure that you keep them with you, if you can. And uh, so you, you write the opinion. Um, you then send the opinion around to the other chambers and you get memos back. It can be as simple as I concur or I disagree. Or somebody says, no, I'm going to be uh, dissenting in this. Or they might send a memo back, a long, involved memo, saying, I think you missed a point here, or I can't really go along with this if you're going to expand the law in this way, or if you're going to contract the law, <clears throat> or if you're not going to deal with this issue. And so then you, 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 you rewrite 
you, you try to incorporate and, and to accommodate as much as you can, and then try to get the, uh, the opinion out. Then, after you have the opinion uh, you, and, and you think that's what it's going to be, you send it to another chamber for what is called a technical. And the law clerks in that chamber look over it, make sure the citations are correct, that the citations are saying what the cases say, uh, make sure that the uh, language, many times you're working on an opinion and you've read the, uh, all that, that goes into it and you know so much about it, you make assumptions and your phraseology may not get you to where you want to be. You, you may have assumed that the listener or the reader knows more about it than they should. And so the, the continuity of the, the phrasing is, is not correct. So they look for, for that sort of thing. Make sure it reads well, that, that someone who coming in off the street can read the opinion and understand it and know what you're talking about. And that's what, the technical. Yeah. What happens if you're the designated author of the opinion and you don't agree with the majority? Do you still write the opinion? You still write the opinion. You try to uh, see if you can convince everybody with your opinion and uh, with memoing back and forth. And at the end of the day, uh, you're still 4-1 uh, or 3-2. Then your opinion becomes the dissent. Mm -hmm. Somebody else, it's reassigned. Oh, it's reassigned. It's reassigned. Somebody else writes it. Um, the, chief, the chief makes the reassignment. All right. Um, can you share some of the more humorous moments while you were on the Supreme Court? Uh, I, the, 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 the Supreme Court is, uh, the, the, it's almost a monastic existence. <laughs> and, and you work alone a lot. And you don't interact a lot with uh, with your colleagues as, as you do uh, in, in, in other endeavors. And uh, for the life of me, I can't think of a really humorous thing right now. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, except, let me except, the, except the continuing being mistaken for uh, for Pat Serna. <laughs> well, then let me rephrase the question: uh, What are some of the more memorable moments uh, that you experienced while on the Supreme Court? Well, I think one of the uh, memorable moments, uh, Gary Johnson was, was governor of the state, and uh, Gary Johnson had kind of a libertarian approach to governance. And uh, when he came in, uh, there was, he had a secretary of health and human services. Uh, well, well, there was a federal statute uh, that, um, Federal monies comes in for, uh, to New Mexico, all states, for, for welfare. And uh, Gary Johnson thought that uh, the welfare system ought to be constricted, that there ought to be uh, 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 greater uh, uh, requirements for people receiving welfare. And so it was in the legislature about whether to uh, restrict the, the, the availability. This is during also the uh, uh, Clinton years when, when People were getting their arms around the whole welfare question. And so the legislature uh, did not act or acted in a way that was less restrictive than, than the governor wanted. And so he decided to ignore what the legislature had done and, and by executive order uh, decided that this is how the welfare system would work and that his Secretary of Health and Human Services would implement it. So a Democratic legislator, a Republican legislator, and welfare recipients who uh, were, were parties uh, to this litigation brought a lawsuit to restrain the governor. And uh, he lost uh, in the district court in Santa Fe, and it was appealed to the Supreme Court uh, of New Mexico. And so we, we wrote an opinion, and we decided that uh, uh, governor, they elected you governor, but not king, and that there's, a, there's <laughs> three ways of doing this. There's executive, legislative, and judicial, and you can propose, and you can, uh, you can sign the order, you can veto it, uh, the law, but you can't create law that that's up to the legislature, and then try again next year. And uh, through the Secretary of Health and Human Services, he, he refused to abide by our order. And so it went back and forth. 
And we sent emissaries trying, we, we didn't want to create a constitutional crisis. And uh, we sent emissaries back and forth trying to avoid a, a confrontation where it was heading, was holding them in contempt of court, <coughs> which, how, how's that going to happen? Um, so uh, it, it did come to that. We, we issued an order, and he ignored it, then an order to show cause. Then he ignored that, but he sent his Health and Human Services Secretary, so we decided to hold a hearing. And before we went in, we thought, well, we're approaching a constitutional crisis where we're going to hold the governor in contempt and send a sheriff up to <laughs> arrest him, I guess. I don't, I don't know how we would have enforced the order, but it was a scary time. I mean, it's, you could laugh about it now, but it was kind of scary. And so we went out there, and uh, the secretary um, then, through counsel, agreed that, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll live to fight another day and, and do this. And so, that 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 was the the the, the, the boil was lanced and nobody got hurt. So, uh, but but it was a very scary time. And, and uh, I say humorous now, but but not then. So that that was very memorable. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many Supreme Courts have ever come face to face <laughs> with with that kind of constitutional crisis. Uh, anything else that you'd like to share with us regarding your time on the Supreme Court? Well, um, uh, except again that, that uh, uh, I, I feel so fortunate, so lucky, uh, that everything in due course, everything in its time. A young man, I was a trial judge in the rough and tumble. Uh, as an older judge, an older man, I, I was on this court, and, and the, uh, the work just suited me perfectly. And, and eventually I did recapture the, the, uh, the, this, all, all of the things that I had missed in law school about how the law works, uh, the, the, the various competing uh, ways that the law develops, uh, the uh, chance to read the, uh, the various scholars, the scholarship that goes into making of the law. All of this and bringing it all together, and, and then to, to let it flow from your pen, let it, and, and be able to write about it, uh, was kind of a remarkable metamorphosis in my uh, in, in, in my development. And it's something that I, I really and truly uh, enjoyed. When you made the decision earlier on in your life that you weren't going to try to be a senator mm -hmm. and you were going to be a lawyer, did you ever envision? that you'd wind up on the New Mexico Supreme Court? No. <laughs> no. no. That, that, that just kind of happened, and, and I don't know exactly how or when. I think, maybe, I think maybe it happened when I was actually practicing law in, and maybe the first job when I was uh, in, in the district attorney's office, and I saw how involved the judge was in the process and how interesting that, that, that kind of work must have been that I, I begin to think, well, that, that might be a career choice, a career path that's much more attainable <laughs> uh, than that. I, I, I'm not sure when I disabuse myself uh, that I'm never going to be a United States Senator. I'm just not going <laughs> to, it's just not going to happen, or I'm, not gonna, I'm, I'm just not going to expend the effort or, or whatever it takes to do Well, that. this would have been your year. This would have been my year. <laughs> You know, there's, there's a sense that I get listening to you talk about your life and your career that, and I don't mean to say this in a way that's embarrassing to you, but it's asking you to talk about yourself. People seem to see something in you that they believe to be special, to either create opportunities for you or open up doors for you or allow you to get to a place that maybe you thought that you would never be able to get to. What, if anything, do you think that is? I, I, let me try to grapple with that because you're right. I, I, I have, uh, I have uh, I've had people do things for me uh, uh, just because they wanted to, uh, you know, work in my campaigns, the, these kinds of things. Um, uh, and and and, uh, and and give me honors that uh, that uh, I you know I'm almost embarrassed <laughs> to receive, 
I have an honorary doctorate from, from my law school, which is, which is, uh, is, is uh, really an honor. Or, or the Hispanic Bar naming me to their short list for appointment to the Supreme Court of the United States, which is uh, just almost laughable from my viewpoint, but, but, uh, yet, never, but I so much appreciate that. <clears throat> I, I don't know. Um, I, um, my, I, it might go back to, to my parents, who, who were really supportive and, and uh, really made me feel special. I, I joked about, the, but but my mom and dad, did. and in my family, uh, my older brother was twenty years older than me. He, he was gone. He, you know, he's not really part of the second family, and so I was the baby, and I was the only boy in the family, and so you had a special position there, and and so uh, um, they made you feel special. And if you felt special, maybe you you made other people think that there was something special about you. Uh, uh, another thing, I, I'm, I'm very short. I'm five feet two inches tall. And for some people, that might be a disadvantage. For me, I always say if I'd been five inches taller, I'd been a bum. So, <laughs> so, so uh, it, because you were, your stature was, you, you had to strive to be noticed. <laughs> you, you, you know, like a little chihuahua dog. <laughs> you had to make some noise. And, and so maybe that was it, that I made enough noise uh, that I came to people's attention and, and, uh, and, and, um, and they liked what they saw and, and went along with it. I, I, it's hard to, with, I, <laughs> it, it's always embarrassing to talk about it. Well, I, I warned you it was going to yeah, be yeah, embarrassing. It, it is, it is. Uh, but, but, but no, but you're right that I, I've had people do many things for me and, and uh, interested in my career and do wonderful things for me. And invite me to serve on committees and, and to speak and address uh, various organizations and do a lot of things that I, I never thought I'd ever have an opportunity to do. Well, let me share something with you. You know, just sitting here and listening to you over the last few hours, uh, the sense that I get is that you have a very unique combination of of a couple of traits. Number one, you seem to be very practical and have a good understanding of how life and people and culture works. And number two, you seem to have a strong adherence to what the rules are. And I'm just wondering how that combination worked in your life. That, that, I, I, yeah, I, I think that might be you're, you're inching towards maybe the essence <laughs> of me or, or or where I came from, the background. And a lot of that might be the parochial school, which, which was a very formalistic sort of thing, and uh, the other adherence to rules. And uh, also my mother was a very strong center of the, uh, the, the family, very, um, very, I don't want to say demanding, but... There's some things I will not do today because I'm afraid my mother would disapprove of <laughs> I mean, that, that kind of attitude. And, and so I, I think we all are a product of where we came from, what our background is. And uh, the practicality uh, is, is uh, simply that, that uh, you don't come from a privileged background. Uh, there are certain things that you do, you, you sc scrape and make your own way. And uh, there are practical ways of doing that. There's certain things that you you have to and must do, and be willing to do uh, within the rules. And so, so uh, that's that's what moves you along. All right. You brought up something before that I was going to touch on before we concluded, and this is a good time to do it. You made the short list yes. from the Hispanic Bar for yes. the U.S. Supreme Court. Yes. Tell us what that was like. Well. Um, it, it was. Ver I was very flattered. I was very excited uh, to, to have been on the on the list. Uh, I knew that it, it was it would never happen for for a number of reasons. Um, it, it, it wasn't going to happen because, um, well, my age at the time that I <laughs> made the list, they were looking for younger people. Uh, it. It seems to happen now that um, 
if you look at all the people that have gone to the the court, uh, they, they have elite elite school backgrounds. They've gone to Harvard Law School, Yale Law School. They went to undergraduates in the Ivy Leagues, you know, these sorts of things. <clears throat> my my background is very pedestrian. I went to the University of New Mexico. I went to George Washington Law School, and I have a Master's of Law from the University of Virginia. And uh, George Washington and Virginia are top 20 law schools, but they're not Harvard and Yale. So uh, I, I did not have uh, the uh, that kind of elite uh, background to to be uh, to make it there. Um, d d um, there, there were other people. The, the, the move there was to get the first Hispanic on the Supreme Court of the United States, and uh, there were other people on that list that um, you know were, were were scholars and professors and this sort of thing. That uh, uh, Justice Co Judge Cabrera from the Court of Appeals, uh, uh, Yale graduate, uh, professor or an adjunct professor at Yale. This kind of that, that's the kind of background one would need. Now, he's too old, I think. There's a whole new generation. <laughs> when they were rechanging the list, they called me and they said, would you do very graciously, <laughs> would you like us to consider you again? I said, no, no, no. He <laughs> says, my time has passed. You really, you need to get serious about that list. You need to get younger people. You need to look at these kinds of, uh, of uh, credentials. And there are a lot more Hispanics with those kinds of credentials in the pool. And you need to embrace those kinds of people and put them on your list. But wasn't that exciting to think it was even a possibility? It was very exciting, and it led to a lot of opportunities. I, I got invited to deliver the commencement address at George Washington Law School. And uh, they gave me an honorary doctorate degree, and uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and I received honorary doctorates together that, that day. And it was on C-SPAN. And so a lot of people uh, from all over the country were writing me and emailing <laughs> me and telling me, I just saw you on your delivering commencement address. And uh, I, I got involved in uh, law school accreditation matters, which I'm still involved in, uh, still do. And, and for six years on the accreditation committee, and now I'm on the Council of Law School uh, uh, accreditation and bar admissions. And I'm going to go to Vienna, Austria this summer to uh, inspect uh, Wake Forest's law school. And just did Elon University in, in uh, North Carolina. So I, it, it led to a lot of things, a lot of opportunities and, and, and uh, things that I... With, without that little credential, uh, would it, w w was came to somebody's attention and was not overlooked. Mm -hmm. You were also involved in the Atrisco airship case. Yes. Uh, tell us about that. Well, I was a uh, I was practicing law at the time, and uh, um, Ben Hernandez. Uh, had just taken over the uh, the representation of the Atrisco land grant, and they were trying. It started with uh, with uh, with uh, 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 um, Marty Chavez's father. Um, uh, what's his first name? Uh, I, I know, I, and I, I can't I'm remember just trying to play. Anyway, he started the process of of uh, Lorenzo Chavez of making a corporation, Westland Development Corporation, and issuing shares of stock instead of having this land grant, all the heirs of the land grant. So the case was assigned to Judge Swope. And uh, Judge Swope, in his infinite wisdom, says, I'm not going to sit here and listen to all of these uh, claims about who are descendants of the original 14 or 17 heirs of the Atrisco land grant. I'm going to name somebody a special master. And so he named me a special master. And so then it was my task to hear all of the disputes. To, we had the names of the uh, original incorporators or the original receivers of the uh, grant from the King of, England, of Spain. And then we had to do the genealogy to figure out who the descendants were. And uh, then if there were disputes, then it came to me as a hearing officer, as a special master, to listen to the evidence and to try to uh, to figure out who they were. It's the first time I ever heard the term raised child. In the Hispanic community, I think in other minority communities, there is a family that's barren and has no children. And there's a, a, a sister or a brother over here that has 12 or 13 kids. And they give a child or, or have help raising, and they, they this person grows up in this other family 
and is a raised child. And the question is, they're both his mother and father, biological mother and father, are heirs to the grant. Does he take a share there? Yes. Now, he was actually raised by the aunt and uncle. Does he take a second share? And so I had a rule whether uh, they did, and I, I ruled that they, they took two shares. Of course, it had to be affirmed in, in, by uh, Judge Swope, and he said, yes, that's correct. <coughs> so we had a lot of interesting, a lot of history that you learn about families. and Early migration of New Mexicans to California before the Depression and then during the Depression, and then a, another migration of the Second World War, like my father, who went out there to work in the shipyards. And so people are coming in from all over the country to claim their their uh, their share. And the Atrisco land grant just sold here the other day and realized the uh, the money from that based on their shares. Had there been no money distributed up until the time of the share? There had been the periodic sale. distributions. And what you're doing, you're taking the major asset of the uh, grant, which was the land. And when they needed operating cash, they'd sell off a, a corner of the grant. <laughs> so you're selling the asset. And uh, so Westland Development Corporation came into existence, and then they started developing the land. And, and uh, a lot of Coors Avenue, they, they had the land lease, and then they uh, give a ground lease, land ownership give a ground lease to banks or strip malls and this sort of thing, started creating revenue for the grant instead of just chopping off and, and selling the assets. So how long was your involvement in that? Well, I was uh, doing that for several months, like four or five or six months, and then I got appointed judge. And I thought, and the, the, the minimum, the, the, the bar fee in those days, we used to have, before it was declared unconstitutional and illegal, they used to tell you what to charge, and it was $20 an hour is what you could charge as a lawyer. <laughs> so I was being paid $20 an hour. And uh, then I became a uh, judge, and I thought, well, it, it's probably not appropriate for me to continue to receive a fee, but it's not appropriate to throw this into a lap halfway done. So I continued to hold hearings during the lunch hour and after work when I first became a judge to try to finish up and make my final report to Judge Swope so that he could either adopt it or, or whatever, and he did. And so so uh, all told, it was about a year's worth of work. What time period was that? It was 72, uh, yeah, 72. Just before, right? that's right, just yeah. before you uh -huh. went on the bench. Yeah, 1972. All right. Um, Maybe into 73. Yeah. You mentioned some of the things that you are interested in these days, like law school accreditation, and, you know, you're apparently asked to give a lot of speeches and talks and stuff like that. Uh, you've been retired for how long again? Six years uh, in July. All right. Uh, how has retirement been for you? been a wonderful ride. <laughs> it, it's uh, it's, it's um, been one of the happiest times of my life. And it, it took me five years to come to grips with the notion of retiring because so much of what you do is who you are. And uh, you work so hard to become Justice Baca, Chief Justice Baca, and then all of a sudden you're, uh, <laughs> you're Joe Baca. <laughs> Taking, and, and, taking out the garbage. You're right, taking out the garbage. <laughs> and how, how are you going to how are you going to do that? And so, but I I I, I did retire, and uh, and then then people uh, impose a guilt trip on you when you're going to retire. They say, "What are you going to do now that you're retired? Are you going to work on a PhD in Asian studies? Are you going to write the great American novel? Are you going to write your memoirs? Are you going to go uh, mountain climbing? Or what are you going to do?" And I had no plan. I thought I might teach in a law school, and uh, but and I, and I I made a couple of forays that way. Got fairly close at one place, and they decided they really wanted me to be a law professor. They wanted me to research and write and go through the whole uh, process, of tenure and all that. And I I decided that no, I don't. I really don't want to do that. I just want to be a visitor. And they didn't want a visitor. They wanted a real professor. So I, I decided not to do that. But I retired. And I read an article by a woman who uh, was retiring from the bureaucracy in New York City. And she talked about this guilt trip that everybody puts on you. And she says, I decided the heck with them, that I am going to retire, and I'm going to go home, and I'm going to do nothing. 
and I'm going to occasionally call a friend of mine. I'll go out to lunch with him. I'm going to have two glasses of wine rather than one, and I'm going to go home and take a nap. <laughs> and, I said, and I said, well, I think I'll do that. <laughs> and so I, I retired, and from uh, July through January, I, uh, I, I cut off all ties with the law. And then in January, I attended a, um, a meeting of the Albuquerque Bar uh, Association luncheon. And uh, a lot of lawyers were surprised to see me around. And then that kind of started a, um, well, you're available for mediations and arbitrations and started a little, little bit of that. So, Are you doing many of those? I, uh, if I can work one day a month, that's all I want to work. <laughs> if I work any more than that, I feel abused. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back on your career. Uh, what well, would al although the first year out, when I, when I finally broke out, of, <laughs> I had my uh, debut, I, I worked virtually every day that first year, and then I scaled back. <laughs> what is that? Ten, explain that to me. I, I, I missed that. Well, the, my debut, when I, on that January, when I oh, went to the Albuquerque uh, Bar luncheon, uh -huh. and then, then it became apparent that I was available. Then, then I, I, oh, then you got a lot of phone got, calls, yeah, and right. people had you yeah. do that. Tell us what you think over your career was the most significant contribution you've made to the practice of law here in New Mexico. Um, I think I think the most significant contribution I've made is being a role model for others. Uh, in my family, my immediate family, I was the first and only lawyer. I told you about I was the only Baca in, in, in the whole United States. And now, by count, I think there are 18 lawyers in my extended family. And almost every one of them kind of, as I talk to them, say, well, yeah, we, you know, I was kind of interested in law. And you, you know, so, so there you were. And so maybe, maybe you had an effect on and. And I've made it a, a point to speak to various law schools and, and colleges and, and different people and, and, uh, and mainly minority students and, and urging them. I just spoke to Rio Grande High School last week. And uh, so I, I think maybe uh, that has probably been the, the, the most significant contribution. That, that you can do it, that you don't have to be born to privilege that uh, you can be the first in your family and that, that opportunities open up. Mm -hmm. Great. Any other aspects of your life or career that you'd like to share with us? I think, uh, I, I think uh, the great joy of my life has been my family. My wife, uh, Dorothy, uh, been my partner and, and, uh, in all of these things. And uh, now she's retired from teaching, and so we're enjoying ourselves immensely. Uh, uh, my children, uh, I revel in their successes. I wish they were all here in Albuquerque, but, uh, but they're not. But uh, it gets me to travel to New York. and to, I'm leaving for Washington on Thursday. I'm going to New York in August and uh, returned from North Carolina a couple of months ago. So we get to see them uh, quite often. Any thoughts about what your legacy has been to the legal profession here in New Mexico? I, I am not sure. Uh, legacy sounds so grand. <laughs> Do we leave a legacy? I, I don't know. Uh, I just think that I have had some effect on, on people on a personal level, like my law clerks, the 20 people who who served as law clerk. Uh, I, I think I hope and shaped their view of how you practice law and how you treat people. Uh, and then, then the other, I think, is the, the role modeling to, to others. that mm -hmm. uh, Not necessarily to become lawyers, but, but to try something different, something new, something that, that maybe might appear to be unattainable. And, and with enough, enough gumption, you can get there. Any words of wisdom? To younger lawyers, lawyers who are just getting started, maybe still in law school? I think one thing I, I, I talk to a lot of people uh, and, uh, about going to law school and uh, negotiating the admission process, which is very, very much different than when I went to law school, very, 
very complex, and what law schools look for in, in picking uh, uh, their, their student body. <clears throat> and then uh, lawyers or young people have a notion of why they want to go to law school. They say, oh, I want to be a great criminal lawyer, or I want to do personal injury work, or I want to do international law, I want to do transactional law. And I tell them, I can guarantee you one thing, that five years out of law school, you're going to be doing something entirely different <laughs> than the reason you went to law school. I can guarantee it. It's going to happen. And much of it will be based on maybe a course you took in law school and something you never thought about. And uh, you take a course, and it's interesting, and you think, well, maybe I want to do that. Or many times it's, it depends on the first job you get out of law school. Or it might depend on the first client. You may be sitting there in a small firm and somebody walks in and they say, I think I have a labor law question or I have a, a, an employment question. And you never even took labor law in, in, in law school. But you listen and you research it and you figure out where to file and who to make the complaint to and what to do. And you shepherd it through and uh, six months, a year, year and a half later, you, you have some success. And then they tell somebody, well, you've got to go see uh, Joe Smith over there because he really knows labor law. Or in the law office, there, 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 there are a couple of people you're working with, and another labor law case comes in and says, well, we have Joe Smith over here, and he knows everything there is. <laughs> and ten years later, you're the labor law expert in Albuquerque, <laughs> and then that's what you're doing. And so I think that's how, uh, how, uh, how, it, how it develops. Okay. And, and so uh, that's when, when people have a preconceived notion of why they're going to law school, I tell them, that's good, keep it, <laughs> but <laughs> it's not going to happen that way. <laughs> so that would be the bit of advice I'd give to neophyte people thinking about going to law school. All right, Justice Baca, I'm out of questions. So <laughs> if you have anything else to add, you're welcome to do it. No, I, uh, I, I just want to thank the senior lawyers. I think this is a, a wonderful opportunity. And, and uh, uh, I know there are people around like me and Justice Frank Keeney that you uh, have, have uh, captured his thoughts, and a lot of people around that have so many ideas uh, about what has happened, stories to tell, mm -hmm. the development of the law, and it, I think it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, service that you're doing here. And thank, well, thank you for you. including me. Thank you, and uh, and I want to thank you for taking your time and being willing to uh, sit through, you know, a fairly long <laughs> videotaped interview. Uh, but this, this is what we're doing. This is the primary program of the Senior Lawyers Division. And we're just really hoping that, you know, we'll save the words and the thoughts and uh, the images of people who have been very important to the legal community in the state of New Mexico. And you are certainly one of those people. So I thank you very much for participating. And uh, we're going to get you a copy of uh, a CD. Uh, of this, excellent. and uh, there'll also be a transcript of it, and uh, you'll be able to share that with whomever you like. Well, thank and you very much. I, I look forward to receiving that. Okay, thank you, and we're going to go off the record at this time. Thanks very much. All right. End of tape three.